The freshwater swamps, lakes, rivers, and marshes of the southern United States are home to the American alligator. The alligator was once hunted almost to the point of extinction. Then it was put on the endangered species list and has made a thriving comeback. Now on the threatened species list, alligators are members of the crocodile family, called crocodilians. There are 22 species of crocodilians which live in various parts of the world, usually within a few hundred miles of the equator. The species include the alligators and caimans, the gharials, and the true crocodiles. Generally, crocodiles have a lighter skin color and a more tapered snout than alligators. The snout is even more streamlined in an Indian crocodilian called the gharial. Narrow jaws are especially fast at snapping shut in the water, and it's not surprising that gharials eat fish. A toothy lookalike from Malaysia called the false gharial is actually one of the true crocodiles. All crocodilians are predators. But some, like the Nile crocodile, are notorious for including humans among their prey. At lengths of up to 20 feet, the Nile crocodile is also one of the world's largest. The colorful Cuban crocodile is so rare, it is found only in Cuba's Zapata swamp. Another rare species is the endangered American crocodile. Although it is more common in South America, only a few can still be found in the United States. These live on the coasts of the Everglades and Florida's northern Keys. More common than their crocodile cousins, American alligators are found in the Gulf states and as far north as the Carolinas. Some of the largest alligators have been found in Louisiana, but Florida leads the way in total population with an estimated one million alligators. Their average lifespan is estimated at 50 to 60 years. Alligators are reptiles and are ectothermic. Ectothermic means cold-blooded. Their blood is not actually cold, but their body temperature will fluctuate to match the temperature of the air or water around them. When they want to warm themselves, they bask in the sun. If they want to cool off, they submerge in water. Alligators look similar to lizards, but they have thicker bodies and tails than most lizards. Alligators are vertebrates, which means they have a backbone. A male alligator can grow to be 12 feet long and weigh between 450 and 550 pounds. A female can grow to be 9 feet in length and weigh approximately 360 pounds. The alligator's skin is thick and tough. It is also rough to the touch and ridged with dozens of small bones called osteoderms. These bones help protect it when attacked. The skin on the belly is smooth. Usually, alligators are black in color and are often mistaken for logs when they're in the water. One of the first things you notice about an alligator is its powerful jaws and large teeth. Jaws that have a biting power of more than 2,000 pounds per square inch. If one of an alligator's cone-shaped teeth breaks off, a new one will grow back. Alligators have very good hearing, and their eyesight is excellent. But they don't see in color like we do. They see only shades of black and white. When they're in the water in search of food, or just trying to stay out of the hot sun, only their eyes and nostrils are above the surface. Alligators have two eyelids that open and close from top to bottom. But they also have a transparent third eyelid that moves sideways across the eye for protection when swimming underwater. When they're underwater, alligators can close their ears and nostrils to keep the water out. They also have a flap of skin that closes off their breathing tubes so that they can open their mouth to catch and eat food underwater. They are powerful swimmers, moving their large tail from side to side to propel themselves through the water. They can swim at speeds of up to 20 miles per hour. Their legs aren't needed to swim like this, and they're tucked neatly behind. 
If they want to swim slowly, they can use their legs to paddle. Alligators usually move slowly on land, but their legs are strong and they can move very quickly if they want to. Alligators are carnivores, that is, they eat meat. They'll eat fish and many kinds of small animals that live in or near the water, including snakes, frogs, turtles, small mammals, and birds. In addition to hunting for their food, they will also scavenge for dead animals, too. To find their meals, alligators often take advantage of the carelessness or mistakes of other animals. This is a heron rookery, where adult herons raise their chicks. Nearby, alligators slowly move closer to the nesting colony. They know that sooner or later, a chick will tumble out of its nest. That, of course, will be food for the alligator. Since cold-blooded animals do not have to maintain their body temperature at one level, they don't require as much food as warm-blooded animals. Alligators do not need to eat very often. They can do well with only one big meal a week, a raccoon, a heron, or one or two garfish. When an alligator catches something big like a raccoon, it will often drown it before eating it. During the dry season, Florida's alligators gather together in shrinking pools of water. Without water to help regulate their body temperature, they will die in the blazing sun. As the water becomes mud and cakes the bodies of the huge reptiles, it seems to change their color to a dingy gray-brown. In the early spring, the adult alligators enter their mating season. Scent glands on their lower jaw secrete a musty fluid that attracts the opposite sex. The large males slap their heads on the water as a way to show their dominance. Here, a savage fight leaves both fighters puffed up and frozen into strange poses. Their neighbors inch closer as if to join in. But oddly enough, it breaks up without any further fighting. A female alligator bellows from a pond. A half a mile away, a huge male roars back. His voice is deeper and slower. From a lake, another male announces his presence. Bellowing is the alligator's mating call. It begins as a powerful tremor within the alligator and radiates outward. His trembling skin can make the water dance. Here, we can actually see the bellow happening a full second before we hear it. Courtship among alligators is a cautious and ponderous affair. The male presses his lower jaw on the head and neck of the female as part of their mating ritual. Eventually, both animals will submerge underwater where actual mating will take place. A male alligator might mate with several females during one season. After that, he plays no part in the raising of the young.
After six dry months, six months of rain begin. In the Everglades, the rising water allows the alligator population to disperse into a thousand square miles of newly flooded wetlands. Two months after mating, the female is ready to lay her eggs. Ponds like these provide a place for her to build a nest. From the air, this alligator's nest looks like a small haystack not very far from the pond. The alligator's nest is made of a big pile of decaying vegetation. The female digs a hole in the top of the mound and lays between 20 and 60 eggs in the center where the nest is wet. Alligator eggs are generally slightly larger than a hen's egg. The female covers her eggs with the damp vegetation. Heat from both the sun and the rotting plants helps to incubate them. They will hatch in about 59 days. Most often, the eggs are laid in the first week of July and hatch at the end of August. The temperature of the incubating embryos determines whether they will become males or females. The eggs high in the chamber will receive the most heat. Eggs that warm up to temperatures above 91 degrees Fahrenheit tend to become males the eggs underneath, with temperatures below 85 degrees, tend to become female. During the incubation period, the mother will guard the nest from predators. In late August, the eggs begin to hatch. When the first hatchlings begin to cry, the mother digs up the rest of the eggs. With a tenderness that seems out of place for this giant reptile, she begins the delicate job of setting her babies free. She deals with the hatchlings one by one. Some are helped out of their shells by the mother cracking the shells in her mouth. Not every egg has a healthy hatchling in it. Feeling no movement in her mouth and realizing the embryo is dead, the mother swallows it. The newly hatched babies are usually eight or nine inches long. On their bellies, they each carry a yolk sac, which will provide them with enough food until they're big enough to catch prey on their own. For at least a week, the babies will show no interest in catching any food. During this time, they will begin to explore the world around them, but they will not stray very far from their mother. Within two weeks, the baby alligators have run out of egg yolk, and they start to hunt for their food. They will eat insects, frogs, and small fish. No food will be provided by their mother, but since baby alligators are natural predators, they don't need any help. Here, an injured dragonfly causes a slight disturbance in the water. For one quiet moment, the alligator is unsure that the dragonfly is living prey. Then, the insect wipes its head. The mother will protect her young for a year or more. By the following spring, the young alligators have nearly doubled their length. During the first six years, they will grow from six inches to a foot a year. Full-grown alligators have no natural enemies, 
but when they are babies, they are very vulnerable. Nearly a dozen of this brood have been eaten by wading birds, otters, and other predators, even though the mother is still nearby. From this group, perhaps no more than a single alligator will survive to adulthood. The American alligator is a unique animal, a survivor. If left alone in its natural habitat, it may continue as a species to live for millions of years more. Sandy deserts and warm tropical forests, there are many different wild animals. One of the most feared and misunderstood is the snake. Snakes are reptiles, as are their relatives, turtles, lizards, alligators, and crocodiles. 150 million years ago, reptiles ruled the world. Dinosaurs were reptiles. Unlike other reptiles, snakes have no legs. Instead of walking, a snake slithers or slides along the ground. Many long and very thin muscles move the snake's ribs and backbone. A snake's backbone is made up of many small vertebrae. Because its backbone consists of many flexible joints, a snake can bend easily, moving in a wavy line. The faster the movement, the faster the snake can travel. The same muscles that help snakes to move on land make it possible for them to swim. Their lungs are well developed and aid in their swimming. All snakes, such as this gopher snake, are covered with scales or plates. Plates form the outer skin of a snake and are smooth and dry. These hard plates also prevent the snake from losing water through its skin. The large scales on the underside of a snake help it to move. As the snake moves forward, the edge of each scale, or plate, catches on the ground and keeps the snake from slipping backwards. If you look closely at a snake's eyes, you'll notice that they have no lids. In fact, a snake's eyes are always open, making it very hard to prove if a snake ever sleeps. Nature protects the snake's eyes by covering them with a clear glassy plate or scale. Now this scale is actually a part of the snake's skin. Snakes usually shed their outer skin layer several times a year. This process is called molting and allows the snake to grow larger.
snake always starts molting at the head. It hooks its skin on a sharp object like a jagged rock and crawls out, taking only a few minutes to leave its old skin behind, clear eye plates and all. that travel through the air. But a snake can hear vibrations along the ground through bones in its skull. Another unusual feature about snakes is their sense of smell. They not only smell with their nose, but also with their tongue. When a snake flicks out its forked tongue, it's actually tasting the air to see if there is food nearby. Let's take a closer look at the snake's tongue. Most people mistakenly believe that a snake can sting with its tongue. This is not true. The dangerous looking tongue is really harmless. Though snakes have curved needle sharp teeth, they are not used for chewing. They point toward the back of the throat and are only used to catch and push food into the throat and stomach. Because it can't chew, a snake must swallow its food whole. Remarkably, a snake can open its mouth wide enough to eat prey larger than itself. It does this by temporarily unhinging the lower jaw to get the food in. Snakes such as the boa constrictor and the python will eat animals as large as a goat. All constrictor snakes, such as the boa constrictor, squeeze their victims to death before they eat them. Other snakes eat their victims live. like the rattlesnake, kill their prey by injecting it with poison, called venom. All poisonous snakes have two hollow teeth called fangs. When they bite into an animal, poison shoots through the fangs into the victim's body, killing it in minutes. Several poisonous snakes, such as this rattlesnake, belong to a group called pit vipers. You can recognize a pit viper by its fangs and the pits or holes on each side of its head between the eye and the nose. The pits can detect body heat, alerting the snake that an unsuspecting animal is near. Besides the rattlesnake, other poisonous pit vipers found in the United States are the water moccasin and the copperhead. poisonous, but it is not a viper. It lives in warm areas of the United States, such as Arizona and New Mexico. All snakes prefer warm weather because they are ectothermic, or cold-blooded. That means snakes don't have a constant body temperature like mammals, but rather their body temperature changes with the weather. When winter comes, snakes crawl into caves, under rocks, or into deep holes in the ground and lie perfectly still until warm weather returns. This winter rest is called hibernation. Some snakes live in regions where it gets too hot for them. Then they have to hide from the blistering sun. This hot weather hibernation is called estivation. But for most snakes, summer means babies. A few snakes, like rattlesnakes and garter snakes, give birth to their young. However, all the rest lay eggs. 
Snake eggs are different from other eggs because their shells are soft. Some mother snakes lay only a few eggs, while others lay as many as 100. The eggs stick together and are usually not very big. These eggs of a king snake are about one and a half inches long. They will hatch in two to three months. Snakes grow up to be all different sizes. Cobras are four to five feet long. Some pythons can be as long as a bus. You might think of the desert when you picture a snake's home, but actually, snakes live almost everywhere. However, they're happiest in tropical climates. Other favorite places to find snakes are in streams, creeks, and rivers. Now, if you really dislike snakes, and you don't ever want to see one, you might think of moving to New Zealand or Ireland, where there are no snakes. However, most snakes are more afraid of you than you are of them. Like other wild animals, snakes will stay out of your way if you don't bother them. They will bite, though, if they are cornered, handled, or stepped on. In books and movies, snakes have always been portrayed as evil serpents just waiting to strike. However, today you have seen that most snakes just like to mind their own business. Learning about snakes is fascinating and fun. Why don't you try and discover more about these interesting and remarkable animals? Australia's best-known wild animal. The name is supposed to come from an Aboriginal word that sounded like gangaroo to Captain Cook, who captured the first of these animals in 1770. Kangaroos and their many relatives belong to a family of animals which scientists call macropods, meaning big feet. They use these big, strong feet to hop, often at very high speed when disturbed. Kangaroos can't walk on four legs as other animals do, nor can they move backwards easily. They belong to a special group of mammals which we call marsupials, because the young grow up in a pouch below the female's chest. The word marsupial comes from the Latin word for a fold of skin or pouch. In most groups of kangaroos, you will see at least one female with her young joey, as it's called, sticking out of the pouch. But how a young joey gets into the pouch is an amazing story. This female kangaroo has just given birth. As she lifts her head, you can see the very small joey crawling upwards, over the fur, towards the pouch. This tiny young kangaroo is quite blind, but soon finds the pouch where it starts to suckle from one of four teats. For the next seven to eight months, this joey will grow here in the pouch. At the end of that time, it will have fur and begin eating grass. By then, it will be too large to fit into the pouch easily. It's hard to imagine that such a tiny embryo could ever grow into an animal taller than a person. This pet kangaroo is about six years old. He's quite tame and friendly, but unlike humans, continues to grow slowly, even in old age. Large kangaroos don't live much beyond 15 years in captivity, and even less in the wild. The large and powerful back legs of kangaroos are quite different to the small front legs, or feet, which are often used like hands to hold things. 
There are something like 45 different species of macropods or hopping marsupials in Australia, the only continent where they're found. The biggest ones are called the great kangaroos. One of these, the red kangaroo, is the largest living marsupial in the world today. Red kangaroos are not very active during the day. Because they feed at night, these animals spend the daylight hours lying under a shady tree or bush. In cooler weather, they'll sometimes bask in the sun to keep warm. The fur colour in red kangaroos can vary quite a lot. Adult males are mostly a rusty red. Females are usually a sort of smoky grey-blue colour. Red kangaroos become fully adult when they are about two years old. They live in small family groups or mobs of four or five individuals with one dominant male and a number of adult females. Sometimes, however, small mobs of kangaroos may join together into one large group of up to a hundred or more animals. Red kangaroos range over a vast area of central Australia. They inhabit scrubland and desert, as well as open grassy plains. In dry conditions, they'll travel great distances to find fresh green food after rain. Here's another of the great kangaroo species, the eastern grey kangaroo. They're also known as foresters because they live in heavily timbered country. They have no distinctive markings at all. Eastern grey kangaroos also live in family groups and move about to feed during the night and early morning. There's a wide range of size and weight in these animals. Some big males can be almost as large as red kangaroos. In the wild, it's sometimes difficult to see this rather timid animal, for the grey-coloured fur is very good camouflage. Eastern grey kangaroos live mainly in the forests and plains along Australia's eastern coastline. In this area of high rainfall, they are very common. Another kangaroo, very similar to the one we've just looked at, but with much darker brown-coloured fur, is the western grey kangaroo. The fur is also longer, and pale tufts of hair in the ears stand out clearly at a distance. Apart from these differences in colour, the western grey kangaroo has a shorter breeding cycle than its relatives, and the young grows more quickly in the pouch. There's little difference in colour between males and females, but males are always much larger. Western grey kangaroos are found throughout the drier scrublands of Western and Southern Australia. A very dark brown variety is found on Flinders Island. Finally, there's the common wallaroo, another of the great kangaroos we're looking at. This animal is really a kind of rock kangaroo, living in much the same parts of Australia as its red and grey relatives. It's also called a euro, or hill kangaroo, in some places. The fur is coarse and shaggy, and you can see other differences from the kangaroos we've seen already. One is that wallaroos have much shorter hind legs, making it easier for them to support their heavy bodies in rocky country. And the soles of the feet are roughened to provide a better grip on slippery surfaces. Like all its relatives, wallaroos feed on grasses and herbs during the night or early morning. The common wallaroo is found in most parts of Australia. It favours rocky terrain and stony rises where there are ledges and caves to hide during the day. 
There are many smaller animals in the kangaroo family. This red-necked wallaby is only different in size to one of the great kangaroos. In most other ways, wallabies are exactly the same as their larger relatives. The palmer wallaby is one of the smallest of all in the kangaroo family. It's about the size of a cat and was thought to be extinct until rediscovered in 1967. Rock wallabies are perhaps the most interesting and beautiful of all the hopping marsupials. This brush-tailed rock wallaby is just one of about 10 different species found in Australia. These little animals, about the size of a small dog, have no trouble living in this rocky terrain. There are plenty of caves where they can hide and the colour of their fur blends well with the surroundings, making them difficult to see. A young rock wallaby just out of the pouch, but not yet weaned, may be left in the shelter of a cave because young animals find it difficult to move about among the rocks and cliffs in this sort of country. The mother returns from time to time to feed the young joey milk from her pouch until it can look after itself. Some members of the kangaroo family are now thought to be extinct. The beautiful and elegant Tulechi wallaby lived in open grassland country and was last seen in 1924. Because these wallabies moved very quickly, people thought they were exciting game animals, especially for hunting with dogs. So Tulechi wallabies were pursued for about 80 years until at last they died out. Another member of the kangaroo family thought to be extinct is the crescent nail-tailed wallaby. This beautiful silky-haired little animal was fairly common in some areas of Western and Central Australia until about the year 1900. But since 1956, not one has been seen, and people suspect that introduced foxes may have caused the serious decline in numbers. It has probably gone forever. Because the front legs of kangaroos are so much smaller than the powerful back legs, all these animals seem to be quite out of balance. The sharp claws on the front legs are used for scratching, cleaning and fighting. The front feet also support the kangaroo when it's feeding or moving slowly. Notice how the tail is used almost like another leg. The back feet are very long and narrow and feature a single large nail of the fourth toe. The two inside toes have joined together, so the foot appears to have only three toes. The long, thin legs of a red kangaroo give little idea of its ability to jump huge distances up to four or five times its own length. Notice how few muscles there seem to be on the front legs compared with the enormous muscles in the hindquarters which give kangaroos great power and speed and support the animal on its tail. The kangaroo uses its tail to walk. The tail lifts the animal's back while the legs are moved forward. Let's look at that again in slow motion. See how the very strong tail muscles lift the kangaroo off the ground. The back legs are then moved forward together to a position alongside the front legs. The kangaroo supports itself on the front legs as it moves. This is called pentapedal motion because in a sense five feet or limbs are being used. Kangaroos move quickly by hopping. Powerful leg muscles make it possible for them to travel faster than most dogs can run. This hopping action is called bipedal motion because two feet are moved together with each jump. Let's see that hopping action again in slow motion. Notice that the front legs and tail don't touch the ground at all. 
As the kangaroo leans forward to jump, its heavy tail acts as a kind of balance. Both hind feet move together all the time. Animals living in groups often run into conflict with each other over personal space or territory. Fights between kangaroos are quite formal events which never end in death or serious injury. Watch these two young grey kangaroos sparring. They use their tails for support while kicking with their feet and grappling with their hands. quickly as it began. All kangaroos eat only grasses or shrubs. They usually find enough moisture in the food they eat, but sometimes will need to drink. Red kangaroos are the largest and certainly the most colourful of the great kangaroos found in Australia. The bright colour on a male's chest comes from a gland in the skin. The large kangaroos we've been looking at are found only in Australia, often in great numbers. None of them are threatened with extinction, despite the fact that in some places, farmers have special permission to shoot kangaroos because of the damage they do to fences and crops. Let's summarize what we know about the family of kangaroos, those amazing animals that walk on five limbs the larger animals are usually called kangaroos, while the smaller ones are known as wallabies. There is really little difference between wallabies and kangaroos except in size and shape. Most of them feed at night and spend the day resting or cleaning their fur. They all eat grass and have few natural enemies. Kangaroos and wallabies are called marsupials because females give birth to very tiny young which then grow in the pouch for seven to eight months. There is only room in the pouch for one young animal at a time. Kangaroos keep growing throughout life and may eventually grow to be as tall as a human being. Because kangaroos have very large hind feet, scientists call them macropods. the most unusual feature of these remarkable animals. and animals, much of inland Australia is a difficult place. For most of the year, little rain falls and the moisture that does reach the ground evaporates quite quickly. Living things tend to dry out. Temperature variations too are extreme. On a hot summer afternoon, the ground surface may be over 70 degrees Celsius. At a winter dawn, the temperature may be below freezing. The soil in many places is dry and sandy. Yet plants manage to survive here, and there are animals too. One sign of animal life is occasional holes in sandy ground, each about four centimeters in diameter. 
Such holes are often found amongst the porcupine grass plants of central and western Australia, plants sometimes called spinifex. Usually, there's no sign of what is responsible for the holes unless you go looking after dark. little animal with its large eyes, long ears, long tail with a tuft of hair on the end, and long hind legs is a desert hopping mouse. Biologists know it as Notomys alexis, the spinifex hopping mouse. Hopping mice are usually about and active at night. Porcupine grass, like many other plants of the dry inland, produces an abundance of seed. This is an important item in the hopping mouse diet. Hopping mice also eat other vegetable matter and any small insects they find. As they move about, they continually meet other mice. Usually the smell is a familiar one, for hopping mice live together with others in a group of perhaps 10 to 15 or so. All have a familiar odour. Sometimes though, a hopping mouse with an unfamiliar smell comes into a feeding area. Usually the stranger retreats from the area. From time to time the mice go back down their holes and into their underground burrows. A hopping mouse burrow can be a large and complex affair. With underground tunnels, larger chambers, and vertical shafts leading to pop holes at the ground surface. To make their burrow, hopping mice dig their first tunnel down at an angle until they're well below the surface. Then the horizontal tunnels, the chambers, and the pop holes. The original opening is filled in. Inside the burrow, Hopping mice continually meet other mice from their own colony. Part of the time spent grooming themselves. But for much of each day, the mice sleep huddled together in one of the chambers deep inside the burrow. Occasionally, there's significant rain in the area, followed by a flush of new growth. This can lead to a new pattern of activity in the hopping mouse colony. Several weeks after the rain, young animals make their appearance. Two or three small, naked young are born to each female. Each is blind at birth. Like the young of other mammals, young hopping mice are cared for by the adults. The mother provides a supply of milk.
The young develop fairly quickly. At 17 days or so, their eyes are still closed, but they can feed and groom themselves. By 21 days, their eyes are open. By about 28 days, they can look after themselves. And by about 50 days, they too are capable of breeding, provided that the food supply is sufficient. If the food supply remains good over a long period, desert hopping mice may keep breeding and become very numerous. Many new colonies are begun. The fact that hopping mice can live at all in inland Australia and become very abundant at times suggests that they're somehow well suited to the dry conditions and temperature extremes found there. Nights in winter can be cold and the days cold too. But by living much of the time underground, hopping mice stay warmer than at the surface. It may be zero above ground and 15 degrees in the nest chamber. By huddling together too, individual hopping mice lose less heat and stay warmer. The hottest weather is met on summer days. With the sand at the surface at 60 or 70 degrees and too hot to walk on, the temperature a metre under the soil is rarely above 32 degrees Celsius. There the mice remain until surface conditions are cooler. In hot weather too, the mice are less active. As a result, they produce less heat. They also stop huddling and spread themselves out. In this way, they lose more heat. And even if their body temperature rises, they can tolerate a greater temperature rise than most other mammals. The way they behave, then, helps them to survive temperature extremes. They also have ways of coping with the water shortage. Where hopping mice live, there's little water to drink. They gain much of their water from the food they eat and seem to be very good at retaining this water in their bodies. Living in a burrow and coming out only at night, for instance, helps to save water. With conditions more humid then, they lose less water by evaporation. Also, adult animals take in the urine produced by their young. As a result, the water that makes up much of the urine is saved. And the adults themselves produce very little urine. So the behaviour of desert hopping mice and the ways in which their bodies function seem to help these little animals to survive the water shortage and extreme temperatures of inland Australia. Their body structure too seems to help their survival. Not many animals, for example, have long back legs like those of hopping mice. Those legs are a structural feature that seems to help them survive in particular circumstances. Like other organisms, hopping mice have predators which feed on them. One is the barn owl. Mice on the ground are continually on the alert. Watch what happens when danger is detected. rapid movements, with many changes of direction. The mice are hard to catch. Now watch them in slow motion. Look particularly at the way they use their back legs. The long back legs of hopping mice, then, are a structural feature that affects the way they move and seems to help them avoid attacks by predators like owls. Study of the lives of desert hopping mice 
suggests that the way their bodies are built, the ways in which they function, and the ways in which the animals behave all suit them very well to the life they lead in the sandy desert country of inland Australia. Hopping mice are well adapted to their environment and way of life. killer, part of nature's scheme. The American Indian, the rancher, the naturalist, each has his own image of the coyote. In truth, no one knows the complete coyote. Once found only on the prairies and deserts of North America, the coyote now ranges from the Arctic to the tropics. In each habitat, the coyote is different his hunting habits and social structure molded by the surroundings. In most habitats, the family consists of a mated pair and its young. But in those parks and refuges of the West, where large mammals winter, biologists are discovering another kind of coyote. a coyote that lives in packs and defends territory. Here, the family structure is much like that of the wolf. In Yellowstone National Park, there is a valley where large herds of bison still roam. In this valley, drained by the Lamar River, the coyote lives in packs and defends territory just as he may have on the plains of the past. Secure in their size and number, bison move freely. They are little concerned with the coyote pack. just spent the first three weeks of their lives in a warm, dark den. And now in early May, they see light and other life for the first time. For the next three months, they will depend completely upon the adult members of the pack for their food and their protection. The pups are seldom left alone. bear and her newborn cub have been detected on the treeless slope below the den. Encounters between bears and coyotes still occur in the Lamar wilderness. Because both are defending their young, this meeting is especially violent. There are no trees for the cub to climb. moves in and steals the cub. In this confrontation, six coyotes work together to achieve a common goal. Only in recent years has such complex social cooperation been documented. The 
coyote pack consists of a mated pair and their offspring of previous years. Normally, the mated pair leads the pack and feeds the young. Remaining adults help defend the pack den, territory, and food sources. Soon after birth, coyote pups begin to learn the skills they will need to survive in the Lamar Valley. Solitary pursuits prepare the young for the independence necessary for individual survival. Interactive play prepares them for the social cooperation vital for pack unity. Some biologists theorize that coyotes howl to establish territorial rights. After the group howl, the adults move off to hunt and mark off the pack's territory. The size of the territory is determined by the availability of winter food, usually in the form of carrion. In the Lamar Valley, since moose and other large mammals are abundant, territories are small, about four square miles. Grassy meadows harbor a dependable supply of mice, ground squirrels, and other rodents. These provide the pack with the bulk of its summer diet. Possessing an acute sense of smell, sharp vision, and keen hearing, the coyote is a finely tuned hunter. Agile enough to catch mice, strong enough to kill large mammals when conditions allow, he is the best example of a generalist predator. Dens are relocated four or five times during the summer. With each new location, the pup's world expands, providing new learning experiences. During the day, adult pack members return with mice, ground squirrels, and bones for their fast-growing young. They often carry the food in their stomachs, and regurgitate it on cue before the begging pups. It is now late August, and the pack is no longer using a den. In the company of adults, the nearly full-grown pups sharpen their hunting skills on small rodents and learn the pack's territorial boundaries along the rivers and streams. Social bonds are constantly reinforced. When a sibling rejoins the pack, a wild greeting tells him and the other members of the pack that all are welcome here. The process of reaching maturity is a gradual one. Even now, almost full grown, these young coyotes still depend upon the adults for some of their food. Teeming grasshoppers now comprise an important source of food for all pack members. The grasshoppers will provide dependable, if meager, nourishment until long after the leaves have fallen. Glaciated ponds in the Lamar Valley add another dimension to the coyote's habitat. Fish scraps left by an otter, eggs of marsh birds, and occasionally a mired elk or deer offer additional food opportunities.
coyotes possess one of the most complex communication systems of any mammal in North America. The song dog uses a myriad of postures and vocalizations, blending one into another to communicate subtle overtones of aggression and submission. Perhaps even joy and sorrow. Eyes, ears, mouth, legs, tail. Each is a means of expression for the coyote. Members of the pack align themselves into a hierarchy based on dominance. A dominant coyote announces his social position with arched back, gaping mouth, and outthrust leg. Effective communication eliminates the need for physical fighting. For the individual, injury is avoided. For the pack, unity is maintained. Organized pack hunts are rare in the Lamar Valley. For even in packs, the 30-pound coyotes are no match for healthy elk and bison. When neither rodents nor carrion is available, coyotes may turn to smaller hooved animals. The coyote tests a band of bighorn sheep for weakened members. With nearby cliffs for refuge, the sheep are content to watch. Winter weather is very important in controlling animal populations. The ground squirrels and grasshoppers of summer are gone, and mice now feed under a protective layer of snow. The coyote who has not perfected the fine art of mousing in snow may perish, for it is the occasional mouse that tides the coyote over. December. The northern Yellowstone elk herd is completing its migration from the surrounding mountains to the Lamar Valley. During the harsh winters, many of the young and the old die and provide ample food for all members of the coyote pack. With little competition for food, juveniles and low-ranking adults remain in the territory. When few carcasses are available, however, Weaker pack members must leave or perish. herds of elk and bison not only determine the size of the coyote pack, but also shape its behavior. Deep snows force elk and bison to forage together on the valley floor. Although old carcasses offer little food to the scavenging coyote, they pose no risk of injury. Coyotes return daily to gnaw away the last bits of flesh of this bull elk. Here in the snowbound Lamar Valley, little is wasted. Out of death comes life. When food is scarce, competition between coyotes can be intense.
The river, though bridged by ice, still serves as an invisible barrier to adjacent coyote packs. This barrier is marked by the coyote's signature, urine in the snow. Because the pack's survival depends upon its defense of this territory and of the carcasses within, warning signs along the boundaries are kept fresh. The coyote is adaptable. When carrion is scarce, he investigates other possibilities. Fish are not usually part of the coyote's diet, but this coyote is quick to cross an ice bridge to reach an otter and its fish. The trickster of Indian legend must now be especially crafty if he's to steal the otter's catch. The task will not be easy. Competing coyotes must first be kept away. To complicate matters, the otter itself is quite capable of defending its food. Here, the coyote demonstrates many of the characteristics which have made him the most successful large predator in North America. Flexibility, toughness, intelligence, endurance. In the Lamar Valley of Yellowstone National Park, the howl of the coyote echoes down the corridors of time. It reminds us of a time when the prairies of North America were filled with wildlife. Of a time when the coyote may well have lived throughout the plains as he does now in this valley. The song dog belongs here. His voice blends with the voices of predator and prey alike in the intricate harmony of the Lamar Valley wilderness. northern woods. The season is changing. The days grow warm and long. The snow is melting. Streams and lakes are uncovered. Spring flowers appear. Trees begin to bud. Some animals are active all winter. Spring brings them food and warmth. These animals will gain weight. Animals lose their winter coats.
Animals change color in spring. Hibernating animals wake up. These animals are in the fields. Bear cubs are born in early spring. Warm days bring back migrating animals. Some birds return every year. This is a Canada goose. The birds build nests. They raise their young. Some birds return to old nests. Other birds choose new nests. The eagle, hawk, and falcon are hunting birds. These birds build nests with open views. Some birds build camouflaged nests. The color of some newborn animals protects them. This antelope fawn uses camouflage. The fawn can lie still. It has no scent either. Spring is a time of rebirth. Plants begin growing again in the spring. Hibernating animals reappear. Migrating animals return. Animals give birth and care for their young. The days become hot. The nights are warm. The sun has reached its highest point. The spring babies have gained weight. They depend less on their parents. Few birds remain in their nests. They are learning to use their wings. It is the middle of summer. The bulls, male animals, go alone to far parts of the woods. They quietly spend the summer. They grow big and become strong. These bulls will join their herds in autumn. They will fight for mates. The summer days are enjoyable. An afternoon thunderstorm interrupts a summer day. The clouds disappear after the hard rain. There is a beautiful sunset. The days become shorter. The sun is lower in the sky. The nights become colder. Berries become ripe. Plants grow seeds. 
The green forests slowly change color. The trees become bright yellow and red. Animals are very busy in autumn. They collect and store food for the winter. Bees fill their hives. Soon the ponds will freeze. Snow will cover the ground. Beavers gather limbs and branches in autumn. The soft wood under the bark is their favorite food. The top of the water will freeze. The beavers will swim under the ice and eat their stored food. Some animals cannot survive the cold. Cooler days warn them to migrate. Migration is another example of the change in seasons. Birds are not the only migrators. The monarch butterfly also migrates. Some fish migrate. They do not feel the climate change. Fish migrate in autumn to mate. Some animals do not migrate. They are not active in winter. These animals hibernate in the coldest months. Hibernating animals search for food before winter. These animals live on stored body fat during hibernation. The black bear searches for a den in late autumn. Autumn is a short season in the mountains. The first snow falls in September. Plants also prepare for winter. They shed their leaves. Plants stop growing and become dormant. Bulls, like the elk and moose, have been alone all summer. They begin moving to lower ground. These are bighorn sheep. They stay in the mountains almost all winter. The sheep will dig for dried grasses. Grasses will be their winter food. In the fall, they fight for a mate. The sheep butt heads. The ptarmigan also lives in the mountains. The feathers of this bird change color in winter. Fall comes quickly to the low elevations. Many animals have begun to mate. are frozen by the end of autumn.
the last migrator leaves, he cannot find any food. The coyote is often a hunter. Without prey, the coyote becomes a scavenger. These animals have thick coats. They are ready for winter. Heavy snowfalls cover the woods. Animals try to move in the deep snow. The elk has little food. The elk begins to eat small branches. Animals search for grasses under the snow. Most plants are frozen. It is winter in the northern wilderness. Snowfalls force the sheep down from the mountains. They search for food on the hillsides. This mountain bird is well camouflaged. The valleys and meadows are quiet. They were full of wildlife a few weeks ago. Many plants grew here in summer. Dozens of moose grazed here. These plants are now covered with snow. The brown moose is easily seen in the white snow. Coyotes search the fields. They look for weak or dead animals. Geysers and warm springs keep some rivers flowing. They become winter habitats for trumpeter swans. The bald eagle fishes in the running water. Nature tests all living things in winter. The strongest will survive and give birth in the spring. The weak, sickly, and old will die. The problems of winter begin to fade. Spring is coming. It will bring new beginnings. Another year is over in the wilderness. A new year will soon begin. poisonous one. Oh. Yeah. Some spiders are poisonous, so you do have to be careful. Have you ever seen a hammock web? No. They're flat ones like that. It's more like a mesh. They're not in regular patterns like this. They're in a sort of mesh, but they're very different from those. Let's go and have a look and see if we can see one. The spider's web is its home and its hunting ground. Look, there's a hammock web. See, it's hung like a hammock between those plants. A spider is underneath. Oh, look, there's another web. Oh, yeah, that's another orb web.
The webs look really delicate, don't they? But in fact, they're really very strong. Oh, more webs. Oh, look, here's another spider. Another non-poisonous one. Can I catch this one? Okay, but be careful. Don't hurt it. Gotcha. Hurry, put the lid on. Got him? Yeah, I got him. We'll have to catch some flies for him, won't we? Yeah. He was so fast, I almost missed him. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, he's doing fine. Uh, have we got a book at home that we could read about him? I'm sure we do. I want to catch a lot more spiders, too. Okay. We may have to go out looking at different times, because some spiders come out only in the morning, and some spiders come out only at night. And some are more active in certain seasons. Some come out in the winter, and some are around only in the summer. Hi, Paul. Hello. You okay? Put your bag down there. Look what we've got. What's in there? Spider. A spider. Take your coat off. Look, it's down here. Okay. Oh, there. Where'd you catch it? Um, we were out walking. We were gonna watch it make a web. They make, you know, those sort of octagonal webs. Yeah. How many legs does a spider have? Eight. Right. And it's got eight eyes, right? It's got six or eight eyes and a two-part body. First, there's its head and thorax, then its abdomen. So it's got two parts to it, and an insect's got three. How do they make their webs? First of all, they've got to spin what is called a bridge line. Right? So they spin from one point to another. So the spider attaches some silk there, moves across to another point, dragging the silk behind it. The silk actually comes out from the tip of its abdomen from the spinnerets. Oh. Now, from there, it spins another piece of silk and it loops it from there to there. So we've got the bridge line and the sagging line there. Now, from this one, it drops down and spins a line and pulls it tight. Oh. And the point of the V is the center of the web. Oh, I see, I see. So that makes its frame? Right. Then it's got to complete the frame so it moves around from point to point, making the frame. And when it's made that nice frame, it goes back to the V point here, the center of the web, and it makes a temporary spiral. Is that so it can walk around? That's right. And as it builds its web, the spider measures the distances with its legs. With its legs? Yes. It uses its legs as a ruler. Oh, I see. So the bigger the spider, the bigger the web? Right. And after the frame is finished, it goes back and spins a different silk, a sticky silk. Oh, is that for catching their food? Right. That's the silk that's going to trap the insects. Oh, wow. wow. And as it completes its web using the sticky silk, it eats the temporary spiral it made before. So the web's an octagon shape. Yeah, sort of. And its shape is made up of all those spirals connected together. And you know that a spider knows how to build a web without ever being taught? Wow, when you see a spider hanging on a web, is it stuck there? Oh, uh, no, because the spider, in fact, has got little tiny hooks on its legs. And when you see a spider hanging upside down, it's actually hooked onto the web. Uh, how do they wrap their food up with the web? Well, you see, the spider is in the middle of the web, hanging upside down, like this, waiting for its prey. And as soon as it feels a vibration on any of those threads, it rushes out really quickly. Of course, the insect is already trapped on the sticky silk, but the spider then spins more silk very quickly from its spinneret and wraps the insect up like a package. Oh, so it can't escape. Right, so it can't escape. The spider wraps the insect up in the silk, and then it bites it and poisons it. Sometimes it eats the insect right away, but often it leaves it in the web for later. There must be something wrong with this one because it doesn't do much. Well, it's already spun a little bit of the web. You know, spiders do different things at different times of day. We'll see what he's done by tomorrow. Chris, Paul. What? Come and have a look. We're coming. 
We're coming. Come and see these house spiders. Where? Look over there. They're huge. That's a female over there. Now this one is the male house spider. Hmm. A way you can tell is to look at those things at the front. The pouch. What? What? Those two things there. They look sort of like it's wearing little boxing gloves. Oh, yeah. That means it's a male. The female also has pouts, but hers are much thinner. How did they get into the bathtub? Did they come through the drain? No, they've fallen into the tub. They were probably walking on the edge and slipped in. And once they've slipped in, they can't get out because the sides are too smooth. What do you think they were doing? Hunting, maybe? Yeah, sometimes they're hunting, looking for flies, looking for food. And sometimes they're looking for a mate. Hey, these look like the ones we've seen down in the basement. Do they? Yeah, they look like the same kind. Well, they probably are. Can we go down there? I think it's over here. Yeah, there he is. That spider, I'm pretty sure is dead. Either that or it's the skin, because when a spider grows big, it sheds its skin. Well, I didn't know that. Here's one that's not dead. You know, these webs are really strong. Every time the spider runs across it, it, it leaves another thread, so the web gets stronger and stronger. See, if I pull it, it doesn't break. Yeah. They're called cobwebs or sheet webs. There's a good web there by the floor. Where? Where? There. Like a little tunnel. It is a tunnel. Can you see the spider? It's waiting for an insect to come by. Yeah, will we see ones like this when we go out looking? No, because these are house spiders. So oh, we won't yeah. find them outside. Anyway, we better get going. Oh, yeah. See what oh, we yeah. can find. Okay. Great. Come on then, let's go. Found one. Right there. See, it's a jumping spider. Where? Up there, can you see him? Look at all those eyes. Now see, this spider has eight separate eyes. It hasn't any compound eyes like insects have. Look, it's part of his web. No, that's not its web. A jumping spider doesn't build one. That's a strand of silk they use as a safety line. Oh. So if they fall, a bit like a mountain climber, yeah. they've got something to hold on to. How do they catch their prey? Now they don't use a web. They just watch for an insect to come by, and they jump. As soon as they capture their food, they eat it right away. Without a web, they don't store food like other spiders. Okay, should we try and catch this one? Have you got a jar? Yeah, I don't want to Quick. Got, got it. Let's have a look. <laughs> Enormous eyes. Come on, let's see what else we can find. Oh, there's one. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful web. Look, see, it's a garden spider. It's a big spider. See its large abdomen and the stripes on its legs? It's got little zigzags. See the web slightly on an angle? Uh-huh. Well, I suppose it makes it better for any flies to get caught in it. Now, do you see that the spider's sitting right in the middle of the web? Yeah. yeah. Well, as soon as it feels any vibration, it will run out along a dry thread. Do you remember oh, when we right. talked about the hey, sticky ones? just went in. <gasps> You're right. He'll never get away. Oh, look at that spider go after it. Do you see how quick he was? Look, it's already starting to wrap the bee. Yeah. It's putting its web stuff around it. Right. It won't eat the bee now. We'll keep it for later? Right. They're very, very sensible spiders. Anyway, we'll leave that one. Okay. We'll let it have its dinner. Come on. Fall is a good time to look for spiders. They mate in the fall, and in cold climates, they hibernate all winter. Then they lay their eggs in the spring, and the eggs hatch out as the weather gets warmer. How long does it take the eggs to hatch? A few weeks, I think. Let's have a look here. There'll be lots of spiders here, I think. Yeah, that's a good place. Hmm. Have a look underneath. 
in these crevices. Hey, look! These two look like they're fighting. Oh, they're little zebra spiders. No, 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 I don't think they're fighting. I think they're going to mate. You see that one? Yeah. Well, that's the male. See what he's doing? Waving his palps and his legs around? That's his courtship dance. But if she might kill him, isn't he afraid? No, I don't think so. It's instinct to mate. If the female sometimes kills the male, it's because she's mistaken him for prey. Oh. Now, can you see the male spider's palps? Remember, they look a little like a kind of boxing glove? That's where he deposits the sperm. Now, see, the female's turned over, and the male puts the sperm into a little pouch that's in her abdomen. Later, because our winters are cold, they'll hibernate, and then in the spring... Eggs! Yes, baby spiders. Anyway, I think we better go now. Can we take these spiders? No, we'll leave them. We won't disturb them. Come on, we'll take home the ones we already have. Hi, Chris. Hi. What are you looking at? Well, Paul said that he saw a cocoon. And he said he thought it was egg. And we've got one, so I'm just taking a look. Hmm. What can you see? It's like a ball of fluff. Hey! Hey, I... Ooh, what? I think it's hatching. Look. Oh, you're right. It is an egg. Oh, that's great. They're tiny, aren't they? Oh, yes, they're so tiny. Little perfect spiders. And the strands of the cocoon. Mm, it looks like wire under the microscope. Yeah. Just look at all those babies. Isn't it terrific seeing them hatch? Uh-huh. Maybe it's because it's so warm that they've hatched early. Yeah. Won't Paul be excited to hear about this? Yeah. Oh, look at that little one there. I wonder if false spiders have hatched. Mm, let's go see. Have your spiders hatched? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got lots of them. Yeah, so do we. It was neat watching them hatch. But now we've got so many, my mom says we'll have to start letting them go. I guess we will, too. It's time to let them go free. temperate zones of Asia are countless quiet streams and ponds. In the shallows of their clear, fresh waters, the currents flow gently and luxuriant plants stretch their leaves and stems towards the surface and the sun. In this habitat lives a very unusual creature that has chosen to live where there is no air, yet it remains an air-breathing animal. This is the world of the diving spider. The diving spider, with the scientific name Argyrometa aquatica, is the only spider able to live underwater. It can survive here because it carries its own supply of air by forming a bubble over its abdomen where the spider's breathing hole is located. The bubble is held in place by two layers of fine hair. In addition, each of these spiders is able to create small air bells, underwater structures, where they can store needed oxygen. The spiders build their air bells where there is some protection such as aquatic plants, to hide them from above.
spider first begins to spin a roof-like web. At the back of the spider's abdomen are six spinnerets. Through them, the silken thread is drawn out. Being almost a sedentary creature, its visual powers are not great, and it must rely on a highly developed sense of touch. It lets out a drag line, fastening it to vegetation as it moves. This will serve as a guide back to the air bell. When the roof is complete, the spider goes to the surface to get air. It tests for the surface with its front legs, turns around, and with a quick scissor-like motion, grasps the air and breaks the top surface tension to form a new bubble. The air is then released under the web. It must repeat this maneuver until the air bell is large enough to hold the spider. In the comfort of its new home, the diving spider spends a great deal of time grooming itself. This keeps the spider's body hair free of fungus. Important, since it is the hair which holds the vital air sac to its body. Like other spiders, the diving spider hunts for live food. Aquatic insects are a favorite prey. It can sense nearby prey by vibration on the silken drag line and must leave the air bell in pursuit of food. of poor eyesight, diving spiders usually wait in ambush for prey to come to them. Fortunately, they can go for weeks without food. When prey does finally stumble into its grasp, the spider must carry its victim to the air bell. Spiders can't eat in water. The enzymes which digest the food would be washed away. So it settles down in the bell to devour its prey. Spiders are among the oldest living creatures on Earth. During the process of evolution, they were one of the first to leave the water for the land. Only this species has returned and has adapted completely to life underwater. Diving spiders live a solitary life. However, there is occasional aggression when they meet. males, unlike other spiders, are larger than the female and hardly ever build their own air bell.
often a male will drive a female out of the bell which she has constructed and take over. During courtship, the male will pursue the female. Often among spiders, the female will kill the male after mating. It is not the case with this species. Nevertheless, he is on guard and keeps his powerful jaws ready to defend himself. Once the female submits to the advances of the male, mating takes place. Now the female creates a special air bell, lines it with silk, in which she lays her eggs. All of her energy is now focused on protecting the eggs. Once hatched, the first mission in the life of every spiderling is to get air. Ancient genetic imprints drive them to the surface to collect the vital oxygen. When this has been accomplished, they return to the familiar surroundings of the mother's air bell. But from the moment of emerging, baby spiders are basically independent. They must provide for themselves. In the complicated web of life, in this underwater jungle, are numerous creatures that prey upon the baby spiders. But nature has arranged that many spiderlings will be hatched, so that enough will live to ensure the survival of the species. mission in life accomplished, the female faces her greatest natural enemy, fungus. As she grooms, she tries to rid herself of the deadly fungus, which has infested her body hair. Her vital air sac is shrinking. She can no longer hold air. All of her efforts are futile. Finally, with her air sac gone, the helpless spider has no choice but to climb out of the water to save herself from drowning. With great effort, she moves toward the air and breaks through the surface. Here, she can breathe again. But a diving spider out of water is out of its element. It is not adapted to life here and will not eat. Death is inevitable. Now, at her natural end, she returns to the place where her life began. Nearby, her offspring are busily beginning their new lives. Nature and instinct are guiding them to spin their silken threads, to go to the surface for air, to locate food, and avoid enemies. In this never-ending process of life, each new generation must repeat the patterns of the past. Nature has equipped each creature to do so in its own distinctive way. This, then, is the world of the diving spider, unique among the marvels and mysteries of the animal world.
sunny days, their gentle buzzing fills the air. You might barely notice them as they fly from flower to flower. But do you know how important honeybees are to you? Honeybees make it possible for us to grow many of the plants we depend on for food. There are about 20,000 different species of bees in the world, and almost all of them make honey. But only one, the honeybee, makes enough honey for people to gather and use. When you see bees on flowers, they are gathering pollen to eat and nectar from which they make honey. The gathering bees eat very little of what they find. They take most of it back to the beehive where it will be used by the whole bee colony that lives there. Beekeepers give their bees ready-made hives like these and the bees build their colonies inside. Each of these wooden hives houses one colony where up to 80,000 bees can live. Here, there are five separate hives. Honeybees might travel as far as 50 miles or about 80 kilometers in a single day as they search for flowers. But most of their time is spent inside the beehive in pitch black darkness. We have to shine lights into parts of this beehive so we can see what goes on inside. Bees are insects and like all adult insects, they have six legs. They also have four wings. Their bodies are divided into three sections, the head, the thorax or middle section, and the abdomen. The head has two antennae or feelers and two large compound eyes. All four wings and six legs are connected to the bee's thorax. The bee's legs have special features that help them perform the many jobs they do. The bee's abdomen contains its main digestive organs, reproductive organs, and its stinger. There are three different kinds or castes of honeybees in a hive, and they all have different jobs to do. The first caste, the queen bee, is the mother of every bee in her hive. The second caste, worker bees, take care of the queen and do many tasks that build or care for the hive. Worker bees are female bees that don't mate or lay eggs. Every honeybee you see on a flower and almost every bee in the hive is a female worker bee. Male bees, called drones, are the third caste. They have larger eyes and larger abdomens. They don't have stingers. Their only job is to mate with the queen bee. The queen bee feels with her antennas to find an empty honeycomb cell to lay an egg in. The egg is the first stage in the bee's four-stage life cycle. The other three stages are larva, pupa, and adult. This four-stage life cycle is known as complete metamorphosis. As the queen lays eggs, she fertilizes most of them with sperm she has stored in her body. A queen bee mates only once during a mating flight that takes place early in her life. After that, she will be able to fertilize eggs for the rest of her life. Her only job is to lay eggs for the colony. She will lay about 1,500 eggs each day in the spring, summer, and fall. Fertilized eggs will develop into female worker bees. Unfertilized eggs will develop into male drone bees. Three days after the queen lays an egg, a tiny worm-like larva will hatch from it. Before it hatches, worker bees put food near the egg so the new larva will have something to eat. The larva is the second stage of the bee's life cycle. It starts out about as big as the head of a pin, but it grows very quickly. For the first three days after the larvae hatch, the workers feed them a special food called royal jelly. It's rich in protein and vitamins and is made by glands on the young worker bee's heads. After three days, the growing larvae are fed a mixture of honey and pollen called bee bread. The larvae eat all day and all night long. After five days, they are still worm-like, but are almost the size of a full-grown adult bee. The larvae are fed by young worker bees that are less than two weeks old. These workers do many chores around the beehive, and what they do depends on how old they are. For the first few days of adulthood, Worker bees have the job of cleaning up the hive. 
Then they become nurse bees and feed and tend the eggs and growing larvae. The temperature inside the beehive must stay the same all the time at 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees centigrade. Some workers have the job of fanning their wings to make air move through the hive. This cools the air and keeps the hive from getting too hot. When the larvae are five or six days old, the workers no longer feed them. Now the workers use flakes of beeswax to cover the opening and seal each larva into its honeycomb cell. The larva inside stretches out and spins a sort of silken cocoon inside its cell. The larva then sheds its skin and becomes a pupa. This is the third stage in the bee's four-stage life cycle. The pupa is a stage many insects go through as they transform from worm-like larvae into adult insects. Even though they are almost colorless, you can see that these pupae are developing into adult bees. Their heads are on the left side of the screen near the tops of their cells. After about 16 days as a pupa, the bee will enter the fourth stage of its life cycle. It will bite a hole in its cell and pull its way out. Now a fully grown adult bee. Female worker bees develop from egg to adult in 21 days. Male drone bees, like this one, develop in 24 days. The drones are so much larger than the workers, they have to drag themselves out of their cells. Their only job in life will be to mate with a queen. In autumn, when food for the hive becomes hard to find, the worker bees drive the drones out of the hive to die. Drones have no stingers and cannot defend themselves. When worker bees are 10 to 12 days old, they stop feeding the larvae and begin to build honeycomb. Honeycomb is made of beeswax, another valuable bee product that people have harvested and used for thousands of years. Beeswax has been used in the manufacture of candles, furniture and floor waxes, ointments, paints, inks, and sculptures. Bees use their wax for building the walls and the storage and birth chambers in their hive. Individual chambers or cells are all shaped like this. They are six-sided spaces, or hexagons. Bees wax is formed in tiny glands in the worker bee's abdomens. Flakes of wax are produced one at a time. With her feet, a worker brings the flakes of wax up to her mouth so she can chew them and make them easier to mold and shape. Worker bees produce wax and build honeycomb all year except in the winter. Worker bees must eat about 10 ounces of honey for every ounce of wax they produce. In the winter, the bees eat very little honey because they are trying to make it last until spring. This is how a bee uses her mouth parts to work the wax. Inside walls and chambers are made using pure beeswax. But bees sometimes mix their wax with resin or soil to form a harder substance for sealing holes or breaks in the hive's outside walls. Honeybees have many ways of communicating with each other. They give and receive messages by touching each other, by exchanging food and other substances, and by dancing to show the location of food sources. Their close communication helps them act cooperatively to accomplish their work, from the simplest jobs to the most complex. The hive's honeycomb system of attached hexagons creates no wasted space and is very strong. But it can be destroyed by melting if the temperature in the hive rises too high. 
The bees keep the hive cool by bringing in water and by flapping their wings to circulate the air. Worker bees that hatch during the summer season live for about six weeks. During their first two or three weeks of life, all their jobs are inside the hive. When they are about 17 days old, they take on guard duty at the hive's entrance. Then, at about three weeks of age, they begin to work outside the hive. They gather nectar and pollen from flowering plants. This is the work that makes bees so important to us. Most fruits and vegetables need bees or other insects to carry their pollen from flower to flower in order for them to produce fruits and seeds. This process is called pollination. Many insects, some birds and other animals also pollinate flowers, but none of them do as much as the honeybee. Without honeybees, we would not be able to grow enough food for all the people and animals on Earth. As bees collect pollen from flowers, they store it in the pollen baskets on their hind legs. When the baskets are full, they fly back to the hive. Bees collect nectar by sucking it through their tube-like tongue which they also use for collecting water. They drink a little water themselves, but they bring most of it back to the hive, where it's used to control the temperature and to keep the nursery cells moist. As gathering bees return to the hive, they must be identified by the guard bees at the entrance. They must also empty their pollen baskets. All the pollen goes into the hive storage area. The nectar they gather is rich in carbohydrates, but like all animals, bees must also eat protein to survive. They get their protein from the pollen, which is also rich in many other nutrients. Pollen is so important to the colony that a special alert goes out whenever the hive's pollen supplies are getting low. Pollen is taken to storage chambers where young worker bees will make sure it is stored properly. Pollen gathered in the fall, along with the stored honey, must feed the colony throughout the winter. Many honeycomb chambers are used only for the storage of pollen. Other chambers are used only for the storage of honey that will be eaten throughout the winter. Here's how the bees make honey. After gathering nectar from flowers in the fields, the bees transfer that nectar to other worker bees in the hive. The nectar is passed from bee to bee, and each bee mixes enzymes from its glands with the nectar. Each bee also removes some of the water from the nectar, making it thicker. This is how bees begin to turn flower nectar into honey. Then, the partially ripe honey is placed into storage chambers where more water will evaporate from it, and it will become even thicker. Worker bees continue to move the honey from chamber to chamber, adding more enzymes to the honey every time they move it. Other bees nearby flap their wings very fast. The breeze they create carries moist air out of the hive and helps the water in the honey evaporate faster. The honey is ready when it becomes thick and ripe. At that point, it is between 17 and 20 percent water and much thicker than the nectar from which it was made. The bees seal the chambers of ripe honey with a thin cover of wax. This keeps the honey from evaporating anymore. All of the summer's hard work will provide the hive with enough stored honey and pollen for the queen and about one quarter of the workers to survive through the winter. Then, the next spring, the queen will again begin laying eggs, and the hive's activities will start all over again.
one of nature's wonder workers, the honeybee, gathering the ingredients for what we call honey, the most perfect natural sweet. Lucky for us, bees make more honey than they need for themselves. To assist them to make more honey and to help us to collect it, we build special houses for them called hives. The smoke quiets the bees and allows handling of hives without sting. The upper chamber of the hive holds the comb where the bees store the honey. The comb made of wax by the bees is composed of little six-sided cells. The comb in the lower chamber is where the bees live, lay their eggs, and raise their young. The hive gets crowded, often 50,000 to 80,000 bees at honey-making time. There are three kinds of bees. First, the worker bee. Always female, she never stops working all her short life of three or four months. She collects the nectar and pollen for food, feeds the young and cleans the cells, builds the combs, waits on the queen, guards the hive, and acts as an air conditioner. Next, the drone, always male. They're bigger, but they don't work. Only one mates with the queen. The others just hang around and eat. They're not equipped to do anything else. They can't gather nectar and pollen, and having no stinger, they're defenseless. And finally, the queen bee. We'll identify her. Nothing is so important to the hive and all its bees as the queen. Without her, the hive would die out. She lays as many as 2,000 eggs a day, half a million in her lifetime of about two or three years. The queen is born in a cell larger than the others. As an unborn larvae, she is fed royal jelly a very nutritious food made by young worker bees. In fact, she has never fed anything else throughout the larval stage. Often several queen larvae are raised together. The first born queen then kills the others, for a queen tolerates no rivals. The queen lays one egg in each cell, and in about 21 days, a bee is born. A little wobbly at first, but ready to work in an hour or two. At first, older bees feed the young. But they soon learn to feed themselves. As a worker, one of her first jobs is nursemaid to unborn baby bees. She makes and feeds them royal jelly. But after several days, the unborn bees are fed a mixture of pollen and honey called bee bread. She joins the others, air cooling the hive, fanning the air with their wings. She might even try to help the guard bee, the bee policewomen, protect the hive. An invader, a moth larvae, natural enemy of the bee. But it's soon gone. In a few days, however, 
she's out with the older bees gathering nectar and pollen. some of the pollen, mixing it with nectar in her mouth. Some she packs into pollen baskets on her hind legs and flies back to the hive. Bees can fly with a load of nectar and water weighing more than they do themselves. Sometimes, a bee deposits the honey in a cell herself. And sometimes, she transfers the honey to house bees, who will take care of it while she goes after more. Did you know that bees collect water? They spread it around inside the hive and fan it with their wings. This evaporates the water and cools the hive. Who said we invented air conditioning? A model of a worker bee shows that its body is formed into three major parts. Large eyes help her see a much wider area than we do. Between them are three small eyes. Long feelers do many things for the bee, as well as act as a nose. The jaws that move sideways are very strong, but bees cannot chew food. They can only drink liquid. A long tongue leads to a tube which sucks nectar from a flower. The midsection, or thorax, carries the wings, two on each side, along with three pairs of hairy legs. Behind the midsection is the abdomen, and on the underside, the wax gland. The honey sac is like a second stomach. At the rear tip of her body is the stinger. The stinger is two tiny, very sharp spears with hooks on the end. She forces them into the skin with a downward pressure of her body. Poison runs into the wound. When she uses her stinger, the hooks get caught in the skin, and she often has to leave them there to escape. When this happens, she dies. A bee sting can be dangerous. Don't strike at it. It may think you are attacking and sting you. If a bee lights on you, don't brush it off. You may get stung. It will soon fly away. The location of a new found garden of flowers is told to the hive by a returning worker by a special dance she performs. She goes into a fast waggle dance. By the sound she makes and the speed of her shaking, other bees can tell how far away the flowers are. The way she is facing points the direction. The odor of her body tells what kind of pollen she has found. Dancing in a circle means the flowers are very close. As the bees fly from plant to plant, some of the pollen from one flower is passed on to another. This exchange of pollen fertilizes the flowers and is called pollinization. 
It has been said that hundreds of thousands of plants would disappear without pollinization by bees. When the hive gets too crowded, part of the bee population of a hive, along with a newly hatched queen, stock up on honey and swarm out. They hang together for a day or two while scout bees go house hunting. together and start a new hive all over again. Man has always watched with wonder how well bees work together and how well they do their job. No man can match the perfection with which they build their combs and its cells. Their selfless care for their queen and for each other is something man has yet to learn. Throughout the ages, the bee has benefited man. A wonder worker and a giver of good things for all, the honeybee. Rocky Mountain Elk, Wyoming natives, and year-round residents. This is the valley known as Jackson Hole, winter range of one of the largest North American elk populations. The ancestors of this king of the deer family probably crossed over from Asia via the Bering Sea Land Bridge during the Pleistocene Glacial Period and arrived in Central North America 25 to 35,000 years ago. We're gonna spend a year with these elk. Elk have inhabited Jackson Hole for at least 500 years, possibly as far back as the last glacial retreat 10,000 years ago. Bull elk have large branching antlers Unlike horns, antlers are shed and regrown every year. The bulls drop their antlers one at a time in the spring. New ones begin growing from the bony extensions of the skull called pedicles, sometimes within hours or at the most within a few days of shedding. The number of points is never an exact indicator of a bull's age. A bull elk in his prime may weigh from 500 to 1,000 pounds and stand four to five feet tall at the shoulders. Sparring is an important factor in establishing rank before the rut. Rut is a term for the fall mating season. These lazy bouts are less serious and almost playful. Occasionally, like brothers in the backyard, tempers will flare. A yearling bull grows a single point or spike antler. Two-year-olds grow branch antlers, each bearing three to five tines. Three-year-olds, like these two bulls in the crick, will have five or six points. As a bull matures, his antlers regrow larger and longer every year until he passes his prime. 
as bellies get full, priorities change. These are the yearling bulls or spikes, the adolescents of the elk herd. As spring lengthens the days and pushes the snow back toward the mountains, New forage appears among the dry grasses. Some elk seem eager to begin spring migration. In their rush to get back to the mountains, they bust through rotting snowbanks, blocking their ancestral migration routes. Spring migration as in fall, is almost invariably led by an experienced old cow. That is, if the bunch wants to be certain of going in the right direction. Elk are matriarchal herd animals. A big bull might drive them, but they are led by an elderly and wise cow. The old cows know the migratory routes, the choicest meadows, the salt licks, the river crossings, and the best open water holes. These are all bull elk. The older bulls have already shed their antlers, usually during March and April. The smaller bulls shed theirs later, sometimes still carrying them through spring migration. There are 5,000 elk in this herd. Once on their way, it's amazing how quickly their migrational instincts return. in the fall rut drift away to the forced hiding places or quiet open meadows to give birth to their calves. As the cow seeks solitude, last year bull calves joined the other males in bachelor herds. Summer storms can be wild and violent. Rain and long hours of sunlight produce the high protein grass that grows fat elk and heavy antlers. The growth of these new antlers is triggered by the increased hours of daylight in the spring. It's the same mechanism that brings the trees to bud. Elk display herding behavior that provides safety in numbers. Some watch while others graze, a sound defense against predators. If there is a threat, the herd will flee. Cow elk become reproductively active at one and a half years of age and remain fertile throughout their 15 to 18 year life expectancy. Twins are rare, but elk have a fairly high reproductive potential. Elk are vocal animals. They communicate with a wide variety of sounds. A human ear may not detect the difference, but the bark of a cow can signal everything from curiosity to danger.
The elk calf is born with a protective coloration like light and shadow sifting through the trees. Newborn calves are virtually scentless. Their first line of defense is to remain motionless. If disturbed or approached, a calf will think into a characteristic hiding stance, legs tucked and head flattened. His spotted light brown coat will hide his 30 to 40 pound body wherever the cow caches him for the first few days. She will return to nurse him a half a dozen or less times a day, protecting him with her absence. He might stand and stretch, but a bark of warning from his mother would drop him into a motionless, nearly invisible heap. It's a struggle to stand on newborn legs, but as the sun moves, his instinct tells him to seek the shadows. At this stage, his premores are already erupting, enabling him to eat grass as young as two weeks. Even calves are capable of a wide range of calls from soft bleeding to a loud, lusty squeal. A person can almost imagine the emotion that fits each noise. begin grazing and join the other cows and calves in a nursery herd. Milk is still essential to growth and the calves continue to nurse all summer. Summer feed includes sedges, grasses, and forbs in the meadows and clearings. Midday will find elk bedded in the cover of the force. As summer advances, they will feed more and more in the trees where the undergrowth is more succulent. Already, they are putting on body fat for winter. Cows are more than a source of nourishment. They must also transfer their knowledge and experience. Each day holds lessons to be learned, and sometimes reluctantly. efficient four-chamber stomach that slowly digests the meal the elk may have grabbed quickly out in the open meadow. While bedded down safely, the elk can regurgitate a mouthful of food and chew it more thoroughly. Antlers are formed of cartilage tissue called bone matrix among the fastest multiplying of any mammalian tissue. The bone matrix contains blood vessels that carry nourishment to the growing antler and to the furry skin called velvet that covers the surface. If a growing antler is damaged or injured, a deformity may result. At the height of the season, total antler growth on a big bull like this can exceed two inches a day. Thank you. 
growth and hardening of these new antlers is not yet complete, but they still come in handy for those tricky, hard to reach spots. These bulls spend the summer readying for the rigors of rut. Growing antlers, storing fat, resting and waiting. These tactics are essential to the bull's success and survival in the fall mating season. Summer gives way to fall in the Rockies. Temperatures drop and the nights grow long and cool. Growth and hardening of the new antlers is complete. Blood vessels in the pedicles constrict and shut off the blood supply and the velvet begins to dry. The bulls become restless and active. They will rub their antlers against trees and shrubs. The velvet then shreds and falls off. As the season progresses, cows enter their estrus or heat and bulls become driven by rut. This big six point could be a herd bull. He'd have little to fear in most confrontations, but he senses that he's no match for this monarch. This bull took on the monarch an hour ago and lost one of his antlers in the battle. A broken antler will push him into a more subordinate rank and will decrease his success during rut. Bugling, the stiff-legged gait, antler presentation, and herding are all rut behaviors. The bugle of the bull elk is a factor in establishing rank, challenging and being challenged. Herd bulls use these elements of threat and dominance to intimidate younger subordinate bulls and isolate them from his cows. This bull patrols his harem and finding no receptive cows among his own issues a challenge to his neighbors. A rival bull responds and runs to meet the challenge. Each tries to out intimidate the other thrashing the brush, presenting his antlers, bugling, and false charging. Most confrontations are settled in this manner. If every challenge ended in combat, injuries and fatalities would be high and detrimental to the herd. These bulls may be too evenly matched to resolve their dispute through intimidation. frenzy of rut quickly burns a herd bull's fat reserves. They expend tremendous amounts of energy, feed sporadically, 
and often enter the winter in poor physical condition. But for now, this bull has won the right to sire a future generation of Rocky Mountain elk. more than 60 kinds of deer found around the world. The largest of these is the moose. There are four other types of deer found in North America. Elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, and caribou. In North America, moose live in a region extending from Maine through Canada to Alaska and south to northern Colorado. The largest moose is found in Alaska and may grow to a height of seven feet or more at the shoulder and weigh up to 1,800 pounds. Extra long legs give them an ungainly appearance. Overhanging lips enable them to easily grip branches when they feed. An unusual growth of skin covered with hair called the bell hangs under its throat. Its purpose is unknown. The bull's heavy flattened antlers spread six feet or more. Each antler has six to 12 short points, which stick out like fingers. The moose has an extremely short tail. They have rather large ears that flop back and forth to pick up the slightest sounds. Moose are generally born in May or June. Cows on their first birthing usually produce a single calf, but thereafter twins. rare occasions, triplets. Bulls do not associate with cows when the calves are young. If food is plentiful, they may spend the entire summer around the same lake or pond. Moose often escape from bothersome flies by moving into deep water. They like to live in forests that have willow swamps with ponds or lakes nearby. Moose are active both during the day and at night. One-year-old moose called yearling will stay close to the cow even after her new calves arrive. The cow, however, doesn't want the yearling around and drives it away. hesitate to cross lakes and rivers. Cows are very attentive to their calves and don't allow them to wander far. 
When cows feed in water, the calves may visit them for a brief period and then return to shore to hide. will establish a pecking order. Generally, the cow with the most calves is the most dominant. As a cow with twins approaches, its presence is sensed by another with but a single calf. Apparently, dominance between these two has already been established because the one with the lone calf prepares to flee. There will be no direct encounters today. Water plants are an important part of a moose's diet. dive as deep as 18 feet to reach water plants. Their food also includes leaves and tender twigs, as well as grass and herbs. With their height, they can reach high to browse on twigs and leaves. Young calves will sample plants, but they prefer the cow's milk. When resting, moose are always on the alert for possible predators. They listen constantly for sounds that may signal danger. For example, a grizzly bear. A healthy moose is less likely to be caught by a grizzly bear than a sick, old, or weak one. This moose calf was killed by a young grizzly. It will furnish food for the bear for several days. Wolves are the most successful predators of moose. Because they work together in packs, they have a better chance to catch a moose. Wolves are active day and night. By late summer, the calves are junior-sized adults and almost weaned. The carefree days of the bulls end as the fall season approaches. This is the rutting season, and bulls must compete with one another for a mate. They strip the velvet off their antlers. Bulls smell the air to pick up the scent of cows and other bulls. They may butt 
antlers and engage in earth-shaking fights to win a mate. However, one will usually retreat before a fight erupts. After the mating season, the cows and bulls stay together through the winter until late spring. By the 1st of January, the bulls have usually shed their antlers. A new set of antlers begin to grow in April. In May or June, new calves are born, and the cycle begins again. The cows must protect and discipline their new offspring. The bulls keep to themselves enjoying life without pressure or strain. Such is the life of the moose, the most colossal and picturesque member of the deer family. In this program, we are going to introduce you to three predators whose lives are almost dependent on one another. Black Jackal, the Hyena. The first family you will meet is a sadly orphaned Black Back Jackal litter of four pups. They have lost their mother due to unexplained circumstances and are left to fend for themselves. And although very young, it is likely that Mother Nature may provide. Blackback jackals make their homes in shallow, deserted ant bear holes where they are safe from predators and they do not wander very far from the lair. They are found in great numbers on about a third of the African continent. are both accomplished scavengers and hunters. Meanwhile, this young litter, being orphans, have to fight for their survival and are forced to venture beyond the safety of their lair in search of food. Scratching among the loose rocks, they hope to find small insects to eat. They instinctively know where to search, often in the most unlikely places, like in the dung of larger animals. Someone they hope to meet is the dung beetle, who is not only food for our orphans, but also assists the jackals in separating the dung, making it easier to find other insects. Sadly, the dung they have found is old and dry, and therefore empty of any life. So, still very hungry and tired, they settle down to rest, making ready for the next day's hunt. Unbeknownst to our orphan family is the fact that it is often common among jackals for an adult to provide food to orphans should he chance upon them. With the full moon acting like a blanket, they spend a lonely and scary night hoping that their luck will change. The next day, our little friends were happy to see an adult jackal near the lair, who they tried to follow. But being so small and weak, they could not catch up to him. Adult jackals are generally known as scavengers, but are also hunters and will hunt smaller prey, such as birds, rabbits, and mice. Being small themselves, no bigger than an ordinary dog, they will never take the chance of hunting big game like this hartebeest. With dangerous horns like these, 
it is wise to keep a safe distance. Other scavengers are the vultures who try to steal the jackal's food and have to be chased away. Black-backed jackals derive their name from the dark stripe that runs across their backs, ending at the tip of a beautiful bushy tail. Always on the lookout for an easy meal, the jackal in turn will patiently follow lions for hours, but always at a safe distance, hoping to snatch tidbits from the lion's kill. This group of lions, however, has no intention of hunting as yet, and are happy to be just playing in the bush. So being a cunning animal, the jackal will not waste his time with the playful lions, but rather leave in search of easier pickings. He is alerted to the noise of a guinea fowl, which he knows are often found at the water hole. They in turn are totally unaware of his presence and fall easy prey to this expert hunter. Fortunately for our young orphans, he remembers them and leaves food at the entrance to the lair, offering them a chance to satisfy their hunger and the opportunity to survive. Later, to fend for themselves and hopefully grow into adult jackals one day. Calling his brothers and sisters to this gift of food, the orphans attack this meal ravenously as they have not eaten for a while and do not know when they may eat again. It is a known fact that in the wild, only the strong will survive. Our second family is more fortunate. Their mother has provided them with a safe home. Hyenas live in much bigger burrows with many tunnels. Lots of families live together, therefore ensuring the safety of the clan. And there is always a family member on guard to protect the younger ones. So hyena cubs are free to sleep and play outdoors with complete safety, even to the extent that they will openly expose themselves. Hyenas are easily recognized by their short back legs and spotted coats. Newly born cubs, however, have no spots at all, and their coats are entirely black. As they grow older, their coats will lighten, leaving behind dark spots, a reminder of their days as pure black cubs. The newly born hyenas are fiercely protected by the rest of the clan and are seldom allowed to venture out of the den. But being naturally inquisitive, like all youngsters, our little friend ventures out to see what his brothers and sisters are up to. Being so closely guarded in his dark tunnel isn't always fun. This little exploration is, nonetheless, under the watchful eye of one of the clan members. An important point to remember is, although hyenas look like dogs, they are actually related to the cat family. Unlike other scavengers and predators, the hyena clan is ruled by a female rather than a male, and she is called the matriarch. Females are bigger and more powerful than the males, and her word is law. This is evident as this youngster scuttles off to the den at her command. When they are young, hyenas are very shy. But do not be fooled by this, as hyenas have the most powerful jaws of all the predators. Those who are too young to go out hunting with the adults spend their days strengthening their powerful teeth and jaws on old bones and horns left over from numerous hunts. The very young spend their time strengthening their teeth on bits of wood and bark, which often get stuck between their teeth, which is very frustrating. Like the jackals, the ever-present vultures also keep an eye on the hyenas, hoping for tidbits that they may scavenge. Protection of the clan plays a very important role in the lives of our hyenas. 
As we all know, there is safety in numbers. This is obvious when the whole clan reacts to the sound of lions in the vicinity. The matriarch goes out to check on the lions to make certain they are not coming too close. Our little baby, meanwhile, is oblivious to the danger, secure in the knowledge that there is always protection at hand. Hyenas are found on about half of the African continent and are very territorial. So when lions enter their territory, they keep a watchful eye on them to make sure there is no danger. Like the jackal, they too will follow the lions in hope that they will find an easy meal. When the lions have made a kill, it is not unusual for a strong hyena clan to steal this from under their noses, which makes it obvious as to why they are mortal enemies. The giraffe is also very wary of lions as they often fall prey to a group of lions on the hunt for food. It is not unusual for a pride of lions to bring down a giraffe several times their size, making their title kings of the jungle easily understandable. You are now meeting our third family and should know what a pride or group of lions looks like. From the males with their golden and black manes to the lionesses with their cubs, lions are very social animals and will spend their days grooming and playing with each other unlike the cheetah and the leopard who are solitary animals. Even while playing, they are always alert to potential danger, especially from hyenas who are known to snatch unprotected cubs from the pride. Lions live in most parts of Africa, except the dry desert regions. Lions prefer to stay in dense bush or grasslands where they are easily hidden from both their prey and their enemies. As you can see, all lions have a black tip at the end of their tails, which serves as a beacon for the cubs to follow. They follow it wherever it may lead. Being social cats, unlike the cheetah and the leopard, lions travel in groups or prides. During the heat of the day, lions are often found basking in the sun, waiting for the temperature to cool down and saving their energy for the late afternoon when most of the animals come to the water holes to drink. When feeding, the males are always entitled to feed first. That is where the saying, the lion share, comes from. The rest of the pride must wait patiently until the male has had his fill. Sometimes a member of the pride may become impatient and she is quickly shown who is boss. Although the lionesses do most of the hunting, the males will always be treated with the utmost respect as he is the protector of the pride. Once he has had his fill, the rest of the pride is entitled to their share. The stronger cubs will get to the carcass first and defend their territory aggressively as the rule of the bush dictates that only the strongest will live. In nature, there is a lesson to be learned from this. For any animal kingdom, only the strongest must survive, ensuring the ongoing strength of the pride. Even though their bellies are full and they have no intention to hunt, lions will sometimes get up to mischief and frighten other animals. The younger ones join in the fun as part of their education and often will do a mock charge, establishing their prowess. Zebra, minding their own business at the water hole, are still very wary of a lioness who is only coming to drink. Zebras instinctively know when lions are fed by their sagging tummies, but they can never be too careful with this unpredictable animal. What this lion does not realize is that she is being stalked, not by an enemy, for lions have very few, but by a love-struck young male out to prove his manliness. She chases him off, with a swift smack to the head, frightening the zebra once again. A blow like that can kill most animals. Having taught him a lesson, she returns to her drinking, ignoring him completely.
the young male, in turn, has no intention of hanging around, taking the chance of receiving another vicious blow. So bitterly disappointed, he saunters off to join the rest of the pride. Here, at least, he is sure of being well-received, as he is an integral part of the social structure of the pride. Physical contact between pride members is very important, especially for the young cubs, as this forms part of their education. It is through this that they learn the art of hunting and how to defend themselves. Romping and playing together, they create mock hunts and fights, which will help as they grow older and at the same time, establish them as valuable members of the pride. They are known as plains game and live on the plains in Africa. The three families you will meet are the zebra, the wildebeest, and the impala. The first family you will meet is the zebra. Are the zebra purely donkeys in football jerseys, or do these stripes serve a valuable purpose? Opinions vary in this regard. Some say that the stripes serve as protection from the tsetse fly, as striped zebra attract less flies than other grazers who are plain colored. Others say that the stripes act as camouflage by breaking up their outline and confusing the predators. This idea has some merit, as a herd of zebra milling together while being hunted must look like a very blurred picture to a predator. Like all animals in Africa, Zebra need water to survive and need to drink at least once a day. Zebra are very noisy and active animals who live out in the open. They do not freeze in response to danger, when perhaps if they did, their camouflage would be of help. In tests, it was found that zebra were attracted to black and white stripes painted onto flat boards. This probably explains why there is a strong herd instinct in the zebra. The stripes help them to identify other family members. Zebra at the water hole drink very nervously because they are very exposed. They will react instantly to any possible danger. Zebra are then likely to group tightly together and retreat to the thicker bush where they feel safer. They can be found on about a quarter of the African continent on grasslands or in thick bush. Unprotected foals can fall prey to a lion on the lookout for an easy meal, so it is not unusual for an adult to rush off trying to attract the lion's attention away from the youngster until he is able to return to the safety of the herd.
Because newborn foals are easy targets for predators, they are able to walk and then run within an hour of their birth. It is instinctive to them to be able to identify their own mother by her stripes, which makes it very easy for the youngster to keep in contact with her. You see, every zebra has its own unique stripe pattern, which is just like a fingerprint. Zebras are grazers, just like horses. Apart from the protection their stripes provide, they have very powerful hind legs that are capable of severely injuring a predator. Our young zebra feels very safe in the presence of the herd and will often just take a nap while the rest of the herd stands guard. An important point to remember is that although zebra often migrate on a seasonal basis prompted by grazing conditions, they are continually on the alert for predators. Zebra mix readily with other plains game and can often be found in the company of the wildebeest who is also a grazer and sometimes known as the fool of the bush. This nickname for our second family of Plains game is derived from his strange attitudes and body language. For no rhyme or reason, the whole herd will react to the antics of one of its members. Cantering or galloping with what assumes is no sense of direction, they will throw their heads up high and roll them from side to side with a stiff-legged motion. They almost look like clowns. They are found scattered over the grasslands of Africa. Like the zebra, they too have a strong herd instinct and will react as one to any form of intrusion, even if it is not threatening. Unlike its name, the adult blue wildebeest are dark brown in color. This serves as excellent camouflage in the tall grass. They have a very strong sense of smell and are known to be able to smell oncoming rains from a long way off. Unlike the zebra, who have no horns, the wildebeest are members of the bossed horn family, which is animals with curved horns and a thick crown. Both the adult male and female have horns, whereas the young wildebeest is fawn in color and rather silly looking with virtually no horns at all. All wildebeest are grazers, just like the zebra and need to eat as often as possible in order to grow big and strong. The constant presence of their mortal enemy, the lion, will always prompt the wildebeest to rush off at a gallop, hoping to avoid this accomplished hunter. wild, not all of them are lucky enough to escape. Another unusual and strange feature of the wildebeest is their V-shaped tail which acts as an effective fly swatter. It is the tail that helps us to tell the difference between the blue wildebeest and the black wildebeest. Blue wildebeest have a plain black tail. The black wildebeest has a white busy tail that looks like a fan when it runs. Buffalo are the other members of the Bost family. The shape of their horns is very much like those of the wildebeest. Buffalo, however, are much larger than the wildebeest and are generally bad tempered. Young wildebeest have straight horns with a very small boss which will thicken as they grow older. All grazers are similar to domestic cows and live off grass. Being plains game, they prefer the open spaces, be it the grasslands with scattered trees or the more dry regions like the salt pans which are found in part of Africa. 
Living on the salt pans and in open spaces has many advantages. Although they are more visible to predators, the wildebeest in turn can spot a predator at a distance and flee in time. Being social creatures, just like the zebra, they will often be found in the company of impala, who they share their grazing with. The impala is our third plains game family. Their social structure is completely different than the zebra and the wildebeest. Impala gather together in two group types. During the breeding season, the herd may comprise of 20 to 40 females with one or two males, or consist of males only, which is called a bachelor herd. It is often found that one male is the leader of a female herd of about 20. In the breeding season, the dominant herd male chases off all other males in the herd. These males then form their own bachelor herd. Impalas are found in the eastern side of Africa and prefer the safety of thick, dense bush. Female herds spend their days grooming each other with the knowledge that should there be any danger, the dominant male will warn them. The impala differ from the zebra and the wildebeest as the impala males have horns and the females have no horns at all. After birth, the impala lamb is very unstable on its legs, making it very vulnerable to predators. The female will hide it in thick bush for the first two days. Unable to walk properly, it is essential that the baby stays hidden, protected from any danger. The impala's greatest enemy is the leopard, who will pounce on a young impala should it venture out from its hiding place, unaware that danger is lurking above. Luckily, this leopard has already had its fill and is only interested in sleeping the impala lamb safely joins its mother. A baby impala recognizes its mother by the tufts of black hair on her hind legs. Underneath these tufts are scent glands which make it possible for the lamb to follow her. Besides these scent glands, impalas also recognize each other by the three stripes on their rump. The male impala is very territorial and has scent glands on its face. With these glands, he leaves his scent on bushes to mark his territory and to warn off intruding males from other herds. Because impala are much smaller than either the zebra or the wildebeest, it is these sharp horns that are their biggest weapon against intruders. You can tell the age of an impala ram by the size and length of its horns. Should any other male venture into his territory, the impala ram will become very aggressive. He grunts to warn the other male that he is trespassing. A savage fight could ensue should the intruder not retreat. Impala fights are short but fierce and can sometimes cause great harm. Females look on in amusement. This intruder has lost the fight and lost one of his horns. To make sure he does not return, the intruder is escorted out of the territory by the dominant herd males to make sure he knows his place in the future. Impalas have excellent hearing and will constantly turn their ears in different directions while grazing to make sure that they are not surprised by an enemy. Being both grazers and browsers, which means eating grass and leaves, the impala stand a better chance of surviving drought conditions, unlike the zebra and wildebeest who are grazers only. 
The very young Impalas stay close to their mothers and nurse the first few months until old enough to go off on their own. Whether they become part of a bachelor herd or become the new male leaders of female herds. breezes blow across this small farm in the Midwest. The animals warm themselves in the golden afternoon sunshine. is a windmill. It pumps water out of the ground for both the animals and the people who live on the farm. On this farm, there's a house for the farmer and his family to live in. There are other buildings too where the farmer keeps tractors and other equipment, food for the animals and the animals themselves. When you think of a farm, you probably think of a barn. It's the big building where the farmer keeps food for the animals. Some of the animals are kept there, too. Some farm animals that you might see on the farm are horses, goats, sheep, pigs, cattle, chickens, and ducks. Most farms have cats and dogs as pets, too. A mother horse is called a mare. A baby horse is called a foal. An hour after it is born, the foal can stand up and run. Young horses are called colts. Its legs are very long now, and as the colt grows older, the rest of its body will catch up to its legs. One year of a horse's life is equal to about three years of yours or mine. There are different kinds of horses, riding horses, harness horses, and ponies. Many people think ponies are baby horses, but they're not. Ponies are just another kind of horse. This is an adult pony, and this is an adult horse. Ponies are much smaller. Farmers used to use horses to pull plows and wagons. Now farmers use machinery like tractors to do most of that. But horses are still wonderful animals to have around. A horse's legs are long and are good for running and jumping. Its front legs carry most of its weight. What we call a horse's foot is really a very large toe. The horse's hoof is like a hard toenail. A horse usually sleeps standing up, but it can also sleep lying down if it wants to. Aren't they beautiful? The long hair that grows on their head and neck is called a mane. It flies in the wind when they run. A horse's wide nostrils help it breathe. Horses can't breathe through their mouth like we can. A horse has the largest eyes of any land animal, one on each side of its head, which allows it to look forward and backward at the same time. A horse also has a very good sense of smell and hearing. Horses should eat three times a day. They eat grass, hay, and grain. They especially like oats. They also need some salt every day. A special treat for a horse is a carrot, or an apple, or a lump of sugar. Many farm horses are kept in the barn at night. The place where a horse stays is called a stall. One reason people keep horses on their farm 
so they can ride them. It takes lots of practice to ride a horse, but many children who live on farms learn to ride before they start school. Cats and kittens are fun pets on a farm. They also help the farmer by keeping mice from getting into the buildings. Do you think this one is looking for a mouse? The stripes on this kitten's fur make it blend so well with the stones and dry leaves, you can hardly see them. People all over the world raise cattle. The female is called a cow, the male is called a bull, and a baby is called a calf. Cows will usually have one baby calf each year, but sometimes they have twins. A lot of cattle together in a group is called a herd. These cattle are dairy cattle. Dairy cows give milk. Farmers sell the milk for us to drink. And from milk comes other dairy products like cream, butter, cheese, yogurt, and everybody's favorite, ice cream. After a cow has had a calf, she begins making milk to feed her calf. The farmer can get milk from the cow too. The milk is stored in a part of her body called an udder. Some farmers raise cattle for the beef they produce. Cattle eat lots of hay and corn. Most of the corn that farmers grow is used to feed farm animals like cattle, pigs, sheep, and chickens. Cattle also eat grass in a field like this, which is called a pasture. You've probably seen cattle and heard their mooing sound when you ride through the countryside. Most dairy cattle live their whole lives on one farm. Puppies and kittens love to play on the farm. Cats have good memories, so they remember people who treat them well. Do you think they remember how other animals treat them? This is a baby goat. Baby goats are called kids. Sometimes the male goat is called a billy goat and the female called a nanny goat. The correct name for a male is buck and the name for a female is doe. The baby goat is born with hair and with his eyes already open. It can run and jump just four hours after it's born. The doe may have as many as three kids at one time. Most goats have beards, and they are cute-looking farm animals. Goats help the farmer and us, too. Maybe you know someone who can't drink cow's milk. Many times, they can drink goat's milk instead. Like cows, goats eat grass. Sometimes we joke that goats will eat almost anything, including tin cans. It's true that they will chew and lick on anything that smells or tastes like food, but they really don't eat things like tin cans. A goat will usually live to be around 12 years old. Some goats also grow wool that people use for making sweaters, jackets, and other things that we wear. Goats are similar to sheep, but are smaller than sheep, and their short tails turn up instead of down. It looks like these goats really enjoy watching the farmer work. Lots of farms have water ponds. A pond is a good place for the farm's animals to get water. And it can also be a resting place for visiting birds like these Canadian geese. Even wild creatures find the farm a safe and healthy place to live. Do you know that a lot of our present day sayings come from animals? Do you have a piggy bank? I'll bet someone has said to you, your room is so messy it looks like a pig pen. Sometimes people wear their hair in pigtails. And think of all the children's story characters that are pigs. A baby pig is called a piglet. Piglets weigh only about two and a half pounds, a kilogram, when they are born. But after a week, they can weigh twice as much. When a pig is fully grown, it could weigh over a thousand pounds, 500 kilograms. A pig's body is covered with coarse hair. Pigs will lie down in mud to keep cool. Because they spend a lot of time in the mud, some people think pigs are dirty. Actually, pigs keep themselves cleaner than do most other farm animals. 
They're smart, too. They're smarter than horses, sheep, or cattle. As a matter of fact, they're the ninth most intelligent animal in the world. Farmers raise pigs for meat products like ham, sausage, pork chops, and bacon. This kitten likes to keep an eye on the piglets. With its sharp claws, the kitten can climb almost anywhere it wants to. Did you know cats can see better in dim light than most other animals, including people? Maybe you've seen how a cat's eyes reflect light when it's dark. Cats can smell and hear very well, too. Usually they're very quiet, but they can meow pretty loud if they want to, especially when they're hungry. Here's another quiet barnyard animal. Most animals need to take naps. These are baby chickens and ducks. They're called chicks and ducklings. Can you tell the difference? This is a chick and this is a duckling. Until they're seven or eight weeks old, they eat only a special kind of food called mash and drink only water. The chicks have fuzzy yellow baby feathers called down. When they grow up, they lose their down and grow white, gray, or brown feathers. Did you know that white chickens lay white eggs and gray and brown chickens lay brown eggs? The adult female chicken is called a hen and the male is called a rooster. Roosters and hens grow special red skin on the top of their heads, which is called a comb. An adult hen lays about 150 eggs a year. It takes 21 days for a chicken egg to hatch. Farmers raise chickens for their eggs and their meat. When the sun comes up and the rooster crows loudly, that crowing awakes all the sleeping animals and people on the farm. And so another day begins on the farm. Animals on the farm have no woes on the farm. Making milk, laying eggs, farmer's friends. We depend on animals. We're happy on the farm. It's fun on the farm. We all can run on the farm. Fun to work, fun to give, fun to grow, fun to live, run in the sun. I have a bed to rest my head. He has a stall, cause he's so tall. She has a pen and cute mother hen has a roost. What a boo! Some 
swims spend all of their time in the water. Some mammals can fly. Some mammals are so small, you can hold them in your hand. And some mammals are the biggest living animals. They look so different from each other. Why do we call them all mammals? Two things about mammals make them different from all other animals. Mammals are the only animals that have hair on their bodies, and the only animals which produce milk to feed their young. In fact, the word mammal is a reference to the female's mammary glands. These enable female mammals to produce the milk which nourishes their newborn young. Their mother's milk is the only food that newborn mammals need. In addition to nursing their young, mammals take good care of their offspring in other ways. Before they're born, most other kinds of animals develop in an egg outside of the mother's body. Young mammals develop inside the mother's body. After her young are born, the mother nurses them and watches over them until they can survive on their own. This may be for a period of a year or more. No other group of animals gives their young such care. The mother grizzly bear will attack anything that threatens her cubs. Since a mammal's offspring are almost always with a parent, the youngsters learn from them. They may learn what foods to eat, and such things as when and where to swim a river. As we said, the other thing that makes mammals different from all other animals is they're the only animals that have hair. The hair of a mammal keeps it warm in cold weather. When the weather gets warmer, the animal may shed some of its hair. Mammals may have many different colors of hair or fur. The color of a mammal's fur may help it to hide from its enemies. The snowshoe hair is brown in summer, but by late autumn, it has lost its brown coat and has grown a new white coat. This will help camouflage it when the winter snow comes. Although once in a while, it gets its new coat before the first snow. Later, its white coat will help it hide from its enemies until spring. In the spring, it will again grow a brown coat of fur. Mammals that spend all of their time in the water, such as dolphins, manatees, and whales have so little hair that we usually don't even see it. To keep them warm, they have a thick layer of fat under their skin. Seals and sea lions have both hair and fat to keep them warm. Besides keeping them warm, hair also helps mammals keep a body temperature that doesn't change much. Mammals and birds are the only two groups of animals that have a warm, constant body temperature. Because of this, we say that they are warm-blooded. This is why, on a very cold winter day, we see only mammals and birds out and moving around. Some mammals, like this bear, dig a den as winter comes on. In a den, under the winter snow, they go into a deep sleep called hibernation. body temperature may drop and they may not eat or drink for months. However, most mammals do not hibernate. 
They are active all winter and must have a steady supply of food and drink during the cold months. Like other animals, mammals breathe air in order to get the oxygen they need to burn their food as fuel for their bodies. For mammals that spend their time on land, obtaining the necessary oxygen is simple. They simply breathe air right into their lungs where the oxygen enters their bloodstream. Manatees, whales, and dolphins are mammals that spend their entire lives in the water. They must come to the surface to get air. Instead of having a nose with nostrils, dolphins and whales have a hole in the top of their heads for breathing. A flap of skin covers the hole when the animal is underwater. The manatee has nostrils high on its nose and only has to put the tip of its nose above the water to get a breath of air. These otters come up for a breath of air. All mammals must come to the surface for air. Mammals that spend much of their time in the water have body parts that help them live in the water. These sea lions have flippers. It's difficult for them to walk on land. But they can swim very well because they use their flippers as paddles. Whales and dolphins have flat tails that they use to push themselves through the water. The manatee's flippers and its broad, flat, rounded tail help it move in the water. The bodies of many mammals that live on land also have features that help them live where they do. For instance, the giraffe has a very long neck. The giraffe's long neck allows it to eat leaves and twigs high up in the trees. This food is out of the reach of most other animals. The elephant's trunk is actually a very long nose. The elephant uses its trunk to pick up water. from the ground and from trees. Primates are a group of mammals. This is a monkey. This is a gorilla. These are lemurs. They are all primates. Some kinds of monkeys from South America can use their tail almost like another hand. Bats are the only kind of mammals that can fly. This bat eats fruit. Many bats eat insects and are a very important way to control insect pests. Their arms are shaped into wings. Their wings are covered with skin. Mammals are 
common animals we often see. Most live on land. Some in water. A few can travel through the air. Some are very small. And some are very large. They have special body parts that help them live in different ways. in cold weather. No other group of animals spends as much time taking care of their young. Mammals are the only animals that nurse their young and have hair on their bodies. Mammals are a common and interesting group of animals. By the way, have you figured out that humans must be mammals too? nature's most mysterious animals, a creature that few of us have observed closely. Bats are the world's only true flying mammals. Some scientists believe that bats are descendants of a small tree-dwelling animal that was able to glide through the air by stretching out long folds of skin between its front and rear legs. Gradually, the bat's front legs and those folds of skin evolved into wings. Its skeleton is similar to other mammals. It has hands with fingers and toes on its feet. Bats differ in size and appearance depending on their species. Some bats are quite large with a wingspan of almost five feet and a body about the size of a pigeon. Others are as small as a bumblebee and weigh only about a quarter of an ounce. Most bats have small, sharp teeth. They chew their food up very fine and digest it quickly. This helps them avoid carrying extra weight while in flight. There are over 900 species of bats. Most of them live in caves and hang upside down, clinging to the rocks with the claws on their feet. When they want to fly, they let go and free fall as much as 15 feet in order to gain air speed before spreading their wings and flying away. Bats live and hunt in various locations and they're often named for their appearance. The long-eared bat eats moths that it finds clinging to leaves and on the walls of buildings. It hears the fluttering of their wings with its giant ears. The horseshoe bat has a nose shaped like a horseshoe. It mainly eats flying insects that it finds near trees and other plants. It lives in the milder areas of Europe, and it's also called the Old World Bat. After it catches a moth, it uses its wings as hands and scoops the prey into its mouth. 
The round-nosed bat of Sri Lanka is a large bat with a wingspan of around 19 inches. Like almost 70% of all bats, the round-nosed bat is an insectivore, which means it eats only insects. The European dwarf bat weighs about a quarter of an ounce and is about the size of a person's thumb. As with most bats, its weak legs aren't much good for walking. It uses them mostly for clinging to overhanging rocks or other surfaces. Mustached bats live in tropical areas. Insect eaters like this one can be very beneficial to us. An individual bat may eat several thousand mosquitoes in a single night. Bats are most active at night. They find their way in the dark by listening with their ears and using a sonar process called echolocation. They emit high-frequency sounds which echo as they bounce off an object. Using these echoes, bats can form an accurate picture of the area in which they're hunting. This ability enables them to locate and catch small insects on the darkest of nights. The horseshoe bat sends its locating sound through its nose. It can emit the sound in a variety of directions. The mustache bat sends out its sounds through its mouth, which is used like a small megaphone. The sound is emitted in short bursts at a low frequency. Each species of bat makes its own kind of noises. Most of these sounds are well beyond the range of human hearing. The long-eared bat uses its own unique sounds to hunt insects. The sound waves are only three milliseconds long, and the frequency changes quickly from high to low. Such sounds are called frequency modulated sound. To discover how bats use echolocation to find and capture their prey, scientists have conducted field and laboratory studies. The purpose of this experiment is to determine if a bat can distinguish between different insects by using its sonar abilities. After outfitting an insect with a light source, the scientists allow it to take off. The soft wax on its back will slow its departure. The scientists will first study how its moving wings change the sound it reflects. The flutter of the wings causes a reaction in the sound recording apparatus. When the scientist moves the microphone, the pattern of the echo changes. A bat can tell by the sound reflections if an insect is facing it or is turned away from it. But do the echoes or reflections vary from insect to insect? The scientist conducts the test in a soundproof room with a camera and a tape recorder. This horseshoe bat has been trained that every time it reacts to the echo sound of a white fly, it receives a worm. The test now is to see if the bat can distinguish between the sound of a ladybug and that of a white fly. Two microphones pick up the sonar sound sent out by the bat. The sound reflections sent back to the bat are either that of a white fly or a ladybug.
the electronically altered sounds are repeated through loudspeakers. The bat is an intelligent animal. When the echoes come from the right, it turns right. And when the sound comes from the left, it turns left. However, when the sound reflections are changed to sound like a ladybug, the bat does not respond. It takes about a year and a half to train a bat to react like the one used in the experiment. What this test proves is that the horseshoe bat can in fact distinguish between various insects by their sound reflections. Lab tests have also revealed the way in which bats use their sonar to track insects. When bats are hunting for insects, they emit sound waves that are quite long. But as the bat closes in on its prey, the sound waves become shorter and shorter until the bat catches the insect. When the hunt is over, the sound waves again become long. The test proves that bats do use echoes to track the movement, direction, and distance of various insects. In the jungles of Jamaica, other scientists have conducted tests to see if the mustached bat hunts in the same way. The mustached bat is the most common mammal in Jamaica, inhabiting a remote northwestern portion of the island. The scientists put together specially designed camera equipment so they can photograph the bats in the wild. They set up a propeller in front of the camera to attract the bats. The rotating blades imitate insect sounds and lure the bats. After one more equipment check, the scientists can only wait. Finally, night falls on the jungle. In their cave, the bats begin to stir. Like many species of bats, the mustached bat lives in a colony that may number into the thousands, possibly the millions. The bats spend the day either sleeping, grooming their fur, or tending their young. But now, just before dark, they become restless. The moment arrives. The night hunters take off. It's a dramatic sight, one which the scientists have been eagerly anticipating. Some of the bats hover around the cave entrance, as though checking the level of light. Then hundreds upon hundreds of bats fly into the darkness. The scientists use sophisticated sound equipment to record the shrill screams which the bats send out. Once out of the cave, the bats fly through the air at 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. The bat detector alerts the photographer, signaling her to get ready. The flash goes off six times for every picture. From the sequence of flashes, the scientists can calculate the direction and speed of the bats. From this and other studies, the scientists have been able to learn that bats can discriminate between patterns, even at night. Like the horseshoe bat, the mustached bat hunts flying insects. They know their territory, 
and they're able to locate and track their prey with their unique sonar abilities. Over millions of years, bats have adapted to their environment in many fascinating ways. Without a doubt, bats are skilled hunters in the night. western part of the United States borders Mexico, you'll find the Sonoran Desert. Here in midsummer, the daytime temperature can reach 113 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade, and the surface of the sand can reach 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat and lack of water can make it difficult for people to live here. Some early pioneering settlements turned into ghost towns. Although people find this environment extremely harsh, many reptiles, birds, and mammals are well adapted to life here. Desert plants, like the different types of cactus, retain enough water to enable them to survive and they provide nourishment to many of the desert's creatures. Amphibians like this toad are another type of animal living here. Amphibians are the smallest class of vertebrates, that is, animals with a backbone. This one has spent the last 10 months hibernating under the sand, waiting for the summer rain. Dust devils skip across the desert, forming clouds of sand. This is an early indication that rain clouds are on the way. By thunder and lightning, the rain begins. It's a truly torrential downpour. Huge raindrops pound on the sand and awaken the toads in their sheltered hideouts. The vibrations caused by the pounding rain serve as the toad's alarm clock. The movement in the surrounding sand wakes them up. Their body's biological rhythms allow them to be wakened by the summer rains, although they sleep right through the winter storms. Within an hour, four inches of rain has fallen. That's too much for this wolf spider. Its shelter is being flooded, so it moves elsewhere. This land had been bone dry. Now it turns into a riverbed. Suddenly, all over the area, toads are digging their way out of the soil. They're called spadefoots because of the adaptation of their hind legs. On their hind legs, there's a small hard growth that the toad uses like a shovel for digging through the desert soil. 
The emerging toads must do two things. They have to regain their energy by eating. And they have to find a mate. These water puddles will dry up within about 10 days. Before that happens, the toads must mate and lay eggs. Then the eggs have to hatch, and the tadpoles develop into toads. So it's a race against time. toads puff up their throats and croak out their mating calls to attract females. The sound carries for miles. There are 60 males and 40 females in this puddle. Because there are fewer females than males, many of the male toads have problems finding a mate. In their urgent search, they will try to mate with virtually anything that moves. Sometimes a male toad mistakes another male for a female. The second toad quickly lets him know he's wrong. Often a lonely male will disturb a mating pair and try to push away his competitor. By paddling with her hind legs, the female toad maneuvers to a place where she can lay her eggs. This might be a submerged rock or perhaps some fallen branches. Here she lays about 4,000 eggs which the male fertilizes. Like other amphibians, these toads go through an incomplete metamorphosis of three stages, which are egg, tadpole, and adult. The eggs develop rapidly in the warm water. In less than 24 hours, the eggs mature into tadpoles. Their complete development from eggs to young adults takes only seven days. The summer rain which wakens the toads also gives a boost of energy to the desert's entire animal population. These ants are repairing their nests, searching for food and caring for their young. Here the ants swarm into flight in their mating ritual. To this lizard, the hatching insects mean a plentiful food supply. The desert plants also come to life. Seeds germinate overnight, and the desert blossoms with brilliant color. Sunlight begins to evaporate the smaller pools of water. Survival here requires rapid development. Plankton multiplies quickly in the warm water. Billions of tiny plants and single-cell animals turn the liquid into a thick, green, nourishing soup. Another amphibian living in this desert is the giant toad. Like other amphibians, the giant toad is ectothermic, or cold-blooded. That means its body temperature stays about the same as the temperature of its surroundings. The giant toads can grow to a length of 15 inches and a weight of 11 ounces. Their metamorphosis from egg to young adult takes longer than that of the spade foot, so they are at greater risk. The risk of their puddle drying up and the risk of falling prey to predators.
evening. With the help of an infrared camera, we can watch the spadefoot toads searching for food. These toads are carnivores, meat eaters. Some of their favorite prey are beetles, insect larvae, grasshoppers, and crickets. Like the toads, the insects come out mainly at night. They're nocturnal. The toads' bulging eyes allow them to see in all directions, even behind them. Although it's no longer a tadpole, this young spadefoot is not yet fully grown. It will reach sexual maturity at the age of four years. The toad eats as much as it can. When the rainy season is over, it must be able to survive on its reserves of body fat during the long underground hibernation, when it will lose up to one half of its body weight. This one's really getting full. Just one last bite, and then mealtime's over. It's time to find shelter. While hurrying to get out of the hot sun, this toad may be ignoring another danger. It hasn't noticed this rattlesnake. The toad regards animals larger than itself as enemies. But it isn't afraid of things that don't move. The snake isn't moving, so the toad comes closer, maybe too close. Lucky for the toad, the snake's already full. The tadpoles find nourishing bacteria and algae at the water's edge. The rain has washed an entire year's accumulation of plant and animal matter into these pools, a feast for these youngsters. Tadpoles are perfect eating machines. They don't stop for anything, not even for other tadpoles. But first they concentrate on the algae. This abundant food source covers the surface of everything in the pond. The tadpole's mouth has many rows of fine, comb-like teeth. Its teeth filter tiny particles of food out of the water. For now it breathes through gills. It's developing lungs, which it will breathe with on land. Its hind legs have already begun to develop. The front legs will appear just before it leaves the pond. During the night, it rains again, further enriching the desert's plant and animal life. It's a good year for the toads. Normally, after the first night, the toads do not return to the pool. Water attracts too many predators. This young one is inexperienced and risks taking an extra swim. This pool is drying up fast and destroying the tadpole's food supply. You'd think the remaining ones would all die, but the spadefoots have developed a survival strategy. Within a couple of days, some of the tadpoles have grown far larger than the others. They're surviving through cannibalism by eating the other tadpoles. There are also other dangers in the pool. This is a large beetle larva. Its favorite food is tiny shrimp, but the larva welcomes spadefoot tadpoles as a side dish. This larva is attacking two tadpoles at the same time. Above the water's surface, it's sunny and peaceful. Here, a newly hatched adult dragonfly dries its wings in the sunshine. Other than predators, the greatest danger for the toads is the searing heat of the sun. It's been eight days since the toad's eggs were fertilized. These youngsters climb out of the water. Immediately, they look for shade. Their instinct is to dig for shelter, but these aren't yet strong enough for that. As the mud dries, large cracks appear, which offer protection from predators and the fierce heat. Of the 4,000 eggs laid by one female toad, only about four young toads survive. Two or three of those will make it through the next four years, when they'll be mature enough to continue the reproductive cycle.
It's now 10 days after that first summer rainfall. The last remaining pool is drying up too quickly for these tadpoles and freshwater shrimp. They won't survive. The shrimp do manage to lay their eggs, which will hatch in next year's summer rain, along with a new generation of tadpoles. The toad's time above ground has ended. Now they'll dig themselves deep into the sand for their 10 months of hibernation. There, below the surface, they'll be well protected from predators and the heat of the desert sun just waiting for the summer rain. A savanna is an open grassy plain where only a few trees and bushes will grow. Savannas are usually in tropical parts of the world, like the Great Savannah on the continent of Africa. The African savanna forms a huge horseshoe around the West African jungle and covers about 620,000 square miles, or a million square kilometers. In spite of its dry, almost desert-like look, the African savanna is home to many of the world's most interesting animals. Today, grasslands cover about one quarter of the Earth's land surface. But only on the African savanna can you still see huge herds of wild grazing animals sharing their struggle for survival with the large hunting animals that prey on them. The soaking rains of the wet season and the burning heat of the dry season force every animal to change and adapt with the environment in order to survive. Many animals of the African savanna live out in the open, protected by their large herds or by their size and power. But some animals are safer if they hide under cover. Can you see the cheetahs hiding here? Cheetahs are large members of the cat family, but they are different from other cats in many ways. All other cats have claws they can pull in or retract. Cheetahs cannot retract their claws. Like the claws of a dog, a cheetah's claws stay out all the time. Also unlike other cats, cheetahs have only one claw on each front foot that is sharp. These sharp claws are called dew claws, and cheetahs use them to capture their prey. The cheetah evolved independently of the other big cats. For instance, it's not as closely related to a tiger as a tiger is to a lion. Unlike lions, tigers, and other big cats, the cheetah does not roar, but it does purr like a house cat. Cheetahs have a short mane when they are young, which disappears as they get older. The cheetah is a carnivore, which means it eats only meat. It is also a predator which means it captures animals to get the meat it needs. Even though the cheetah is a predator, it isn't large enough or powerful enough to be safe out in the open all the time. Cheetah cubs and even adult cheetahs are in danger from lions, hyenas, leopards, and wild dogs. That's why these cheetah cubs stay undercover most of the time. Their mother will stay with them until it's time for her to hunt again. Cheetahs hunt during the daytime, using their excellent eyesight to find prey. They can chase their prey at speeds of up to 70 miles or 113 kilometers per hour, making them the fastest animals on land. Cheetahs prey upon many large and small animals, but their favorite prey is Thompson's gazelle a small kind of antelope that lives in huge herds on the African savanna. Sometimes cheetahs will hunt wildebeest or zebras, but they usually leave these larger animals alone. Even prey animals have ways to defend themselves, and every hunt is a risk for the hunter. Zebras, for instance, can bite or kick with their sharp hooves. Ostriches can defend themselves with powerful kicks. 
These ostriches live in small groups of five or six adults. Female ostriches will often combine their nests so their eggs will be easier to guard. When the chicks hatch, they will combine their families and share babysitting duties. Ostriches sometimes run with large herds of antelope or zebra to be safer from predators. Some animals don't have to worry much about being safe. A full-grown rhinoceros has no natural enemies at all. But like the elephant, people have hunted the rhinoceros to dangerously low levels. New laws to stop poachers are helping them to survive. Millions of years ago, there were many different species of elephant-like animals living all over the world. Now, there are only two, the Asian elephant and the African elephant. All elephants live in groups called herds. African elephant herds live in the forest and on the savanna. African savanna elephants are larger than forest elephants or Asian elephants. The adult males stand about 10 feet or 3 meters tall and weigh about 10,000 pounds or over 4 metric tons. Since elephants eat only plant foods, they have to eat a lot. An adult elephant eats about 335 pounds or 150 kilograms of food every day. They eat leaves, roots, grasses, fruits, and bark. Elephants use just four molar teeth to crunch all their food. As that set of teeth wears out, another set can grow to replace it. Elephants use their tusks to peel tree bark, dig up roots, and to scare their enemies. The tusks are made of a hard white material called ivory. They are the reason people have hunted elephants for so many years. Like the rhinoceros, a full-grown elephant has no enemies except people who hunt illegally. But elephants must protect their babies from animal predators. Baby elephants, called calves, are smart and playful. They are cared for by their mothers as well as other adults in the herd. It takes 10 years for a calf to become a full-grown adult. But male elephants keep growing until they are 20 to 30 years old. When the females grow up, they stay with the herd and have calves of their own. When the males grow up, they leave the herd. If the herd becomes too big, it will break up into new, smaller herds. Elephants can live to be 70 years old. Giraffes are even taller than elephants, but they weigh much less. An adult giraffe is 14 to 19 feet tall. That's 4 to 6 meters. Their legs are longer than many people are tall. They eat leaves, twigs, and bark, especially from acacia trees. Their height and long necks let them get to food that other animals can't reach. Their tongues are long, too. They use their tongues to pull tender leaves into their mouths. All giraffes have tan coats with brown spots but no two giraffes have exactly the same pattern of spots. The giraffe spots help camouflage or hide it as it stands and eats around trees. But even in the open, giraffes have ways of protecting themselves. Giraffes have very good eyesight, and from their height, it's like seeing from a lookout tower. When they see an enemy, giraffes can run 35 miles or 56 kilometers an hour to get away. Adult giraffes are large enough that they don't have many enemies, but they do have to watch out for lions. Lions are the largest predators on the African savanna. They will hunt any animal they can kill, and they can kill any animal on the savanna except an adult elephant or rhinoceros. For such ferocious hunters, Lions get along very well among themselves. In fact, lions are the only cats in the world that live in permanent groups. Their groups are called prides. Each pride has up to nine adult males and 
up to 18 adult females and their cubs. The lions in a pride do almost everything together. They all rest together during the hottest part of the day. The females care for each other's cubs and hunt together, but the males never hunt. That might be because their manes and larger bodies make it harder for them to sneak up on prey. The females bring home all the food for the pride. There are usually a lot of different kinds of animals near water holes on the dry African savanna. But when lions are there, all the other animals keep their distance. Water is needed by every living thing on Earth, but it has a special importance here where it only rains during one part of the year. The rest of the year is bone dry. Animals either migrate to follow the rain or have to be clever enough to find the water they need. The hippopotamus needs lots of water. It actually lives in water most of the time. Many rivers run through the savanna country. Some of them flow all year, and others run only during the rainy season. Hippos live in many of these rivers. Even though it looks like a land animal, the hippo is well suited to its life in the water. Its eyes, ears, and nostrils are on top of its head so it can see, hear, and breathe when the rest of its body is underwater. Hippos are very good swimmers, and adults can stay underwater without breathing for as long as five minutes. River hippos of the savanna country are huge animals. Adults can be 12 to 15 feet long. That's four to five meters. They weigh 5,000 to 8,000 pounds or 2,200 to 3,700 kilograms. Hippos eat some water plants, but their favorite food is grass. After dark, they climb out of the river to graze, eating huge amounts of grass every night. Back on dry land, one of the cheetah cubs plays in the grass. The mother cheetah has gone to hunt, she might not be successful at catching a meal today. In spite of their speed, cheetahs only catch a small number of the prey animals they chase. Gazelles and other animals can zigzag to avoid the cheetah until it finally tires out. Cheetahs can run fast, but they can't run very far. Play attacking like this helps prepare the cub for the day it will have to hunt its own food. A hunting cheetah doesn't just start running when it sees an animal it wants to catch. They use a plan or strategy to give themselves the best chance of catching their prey. After it sights prey, the cheetah begins to stalk. That means it slowly creeps toward the prey, sometimes sitting or crouching down to keep from being seen. The idea is to get as close as possible before starting to run. The cheetah's spotted coat helps it blend in with the savanna grasses so it's harder for the prey to see. As the cheetah hunts, her cubs wait under cover. They are in the most danger when she leaves them alone. If a lion or leopard finds them now, they could be killed. Thompson's gazelle are probably the cheetah's favorite food because they are smaller than zebra or wildebeest and because there are so many Thompson's gazelle on the African savanna. Predators actually help the herds of gazelle and other prey animals to become healthier and stronger. As a predator stalks and watches its prey, it looks for an animal that seems old, sick, or weak. Since the strongest, fastest animals will escape from a predator, they will live to breed and have young, which will also be strong and fast. These Thompson's gazelle don't seem to notice the cheetah as she moves closer and closer to them. She knows that as soon as she begins her chase, the gazelle will begin to run. She has to catch one before she tires out, so she tries to guess how close she can creep up without letting them see her. She has picked out the animal she wants to capture. Finally, the cheetah is ready to make a sudden dash toward her prey. Gazelle usually try to lose a predator by making quick turns in every direction. Sometimes it works. But this time, it looks like the cheetah will be successful.
The cheetah's hungry cubs wait for her to come home with the catch. The cubs have run out to greet their mother and want to eat right now. But she knows they will be safer eating under cover. So she continues to drag the carcass toward the trees. She's trying to prevent lions, leopards, hyenas, or wild dogs from stealing their food. Hyenas are very good at hunting their own food, but they also scavenge. That means eat another predator's leftovers, and they steal kills from other predators. With a hyena on the prowl, the mother cheetah needs to get her cubs and their dinner into hiding right away, where they'll be able to eat without unwanted company. The herd of Thompson's gazelle are nervous after the cheetah's attack, but the cheetah won't hunt them until her family is hungry again. Most predators will eat as much meat as their stomachs will hold whenever food is available. Then they sleep and rest until they feel hungry again. That might not be for a day or even two days. When the cheetahs have eaten all they want, vultures will probably find the gazelle carcass and pick at it for scraps. Vultures never hunt live animals. Instead, they eat only the meat left over after predators have eaten their kills. This meat is called carrion. Vultures find carrion by using their excellent eyesight. They look for signs that could mean some carrion has been found. When they see other vultures circling in the sky, which they can see from very far away, they will fly there to investigate. Some people think that vultures and other scavengers are disgusting or somehow bad. But scavengers are some of the most useful animals in the world. They are nature's cleanup crew, getting rid of leftover meat before it rots and spreads disease to animals that are alive and healthy. Scavengers, like all animals on the African savanna, play a part in the balance of nature. Some of the animal's lives may seem harsh or cruel, but each one is just doing what it was born to do. Even in this land where most food crops won't grow, more and more wild areas have disappeared. The governments of many African countries have set aside parks and preserves so the wonderful animals of the African savanna will be able to survive. going to introduce you to two animals who are sometimes known as the tanks of Africa. The elephant and the rhino. Our first tank family is the elephant. Elephants are known as the biggest mammals on Earth and are easily recognized by their large ears, long trunks, and ivory tusks, all of which serve a very important purpose in the lives of elephants. The trunk, you see, helps the elephant with a lot of other things in order to survive, like reaching high into the branches of trees in order to find the succulent leaves which they prefer. An elephant feeds at least 14 hours a day and can eat as much as 375 pounds or 170 kilograms of leaves and grass in order to supply its huge body. Although mainly browsers, they will often eat grass using their feet to cut and pulling it with their trunk. The trunk is used for communication, as can be seen from this big tusker, who, trumpeting loudly, chases a competitor away from his place at the water hole. The trunk is also used for drinking water, which an elephant pours down its throat, and for cooling itself by throwing dust, water, and mud over its body. This helps protect them from ticks and other parasites, something youngsters learn very quickly from their parents. With poor eyesight, the trunk serves as an excellent warning system when testing the air for any possible danger and acts like a two-fingered hand being able to pick up single seeds or pods. 
Trees are very important to our elephants, not only for the food trees provide, but for the shade against the midday heat. Elephants can be very destructive as they like to test their strength, often pushing down trees just for the fun of it. Their big ears also serve an important purpose. You will often see elephants flapping their huge ears. Their bodies get very hot due to their immense size, and by flapping their ears, the elephants are able to create a cool breeze across their bodies. This is very important and assists the elephants by reducing their body temperature by at least 20%. An elephant will drink an average of once a day, if possible, downing as much as 40 gallons or 150 liters of water if very thirsty. The time has come to mention those giant toothpicks known as tusks. Tusks are very important to the elephant for survival. Not only are they used as weapons to defend themselves from enemies, but they are also used as a tool for stripping bark from trees, which is a favorite food of our elephants. The tusks are defense weapons against predators and are often used against competitors, especially among breeding males. You will often see that one tusk is shorter than the other. This is due to the fact that they use one side more than the other so it gets worn down and is more likely to be broken accidentally. As can be seen from this youngster who has only one tusk left. Fortunately for elephants, their tusks grow throughout their lives, and this fellow is likely to have his tusk grow back in the future. Because of their huge bodies, it is understandable why they have such large legs which look like tree trunks and can carry the elephant over long distances. Once again, it is fortunate that their tusks keep growing as they are well used and can chip and, as seen before, can even break off completely. It is due to these ivory tusks that the survival of the elephant species became threatened in certain parts of Africa. Poachers, with no thought for the elephants, were killing them by the hundreds just for their ivory, which would later be made into jewelry and other items, leaving their carcasses to rot in the African sun. On a happier note, elephants are very social animals, the members of a family group together and take good care of one another. The herd is led by a female known as the matriarch, who the herd will always follow. Males join the herd during the mating season. The young calves get special attention from the adults who help them climb steep banks, pull them out of sticky mud, and protect them from predators. Like all newly born babies in the wild, they are especially vulnerable to predators like the lion and the hyena. After birth, a young calf will drink milk from its mother for at least two to three years before it ventures on its own. The wonderful thing about elephants is, if a baby becomes orphaned, other females will immediately adopt it and care for it. This baby, however, is very safe under the protection of its mother and the rest of the herd, but very confused about this long snout and what it is used for. He decides to enter the water with the other teenagers, where they play happily, splashing each other with water and mud, trunk wrestle, and practice fighting in pushing competitions. These are lessons learned from their parents. The muddy coating not only protects them from parasites, but also helps them to keep cool. And when they leave the water, they look almost like little chocolate elephants. Other animals at the water hole seem to respect the size of the elephants and let them drink first. While the youngsters in turn will mock charge the other small animals in a playful way. This lady looks as if she may be suffering from a headache, but she is only resting her heavy trunk on her forehead. Even giraffe and the beautiful Gemsbach will give way to elephants coming to drink. 
You see, a running and cross elephant can reach speeds of 25 miles per hour or 40 kilometers per hour, so it's wise to get out of the way. It is hard to believe that these big animals can run so fast. The little ones try to keep up with the adults, but tire very easily. One need not worry, because they will never be left unprotected. This herd has sensed danger, so they will push the calves into the middle, forming a circle around them to protect them from any danger. In times of severe drought, an elephant herd will walk many miles in search of better grazing conditions, often crossing deep rivers where their trunks are important to them. Not only does the trunk act as a snorkel to help them to breathe underwater, but it also helps the youngsters to keep in contact with their mothers. are found on about two-thirds of the African continent. And can become very aggressive with a rhino at the water hole. Even the rhino, which is itself a strong beast, will give way in the face of this charging mass. Rhinos are easily recognized by their tank-like bodies, pig-like ears and tail, and short but powerful legs. An interesting point to remember is there are two types of rhino, the black and the white rhino. Their names have little to do with their color, as both are gray, and they are very difficult to tell apart except for their different lips. The white rhino has a square lip and is more docile. The black rhino has a hooked lip and is more aggressive. Rhino, unfortunately, have very poor eyesight but their hearing and sense of smell is extremely powerful. Unlike the elephant, whose tusks are made of ivory, the rhino's horn is made of coarse, compressed hair and is very, very hard. If disturbed, they will lift up their pig-like tail and rush off. A charging rhino is to be avoided, as they can reach speeds of up to 30 miles or 50 kilometers per hour. Now let us meet our young rhino friend who is a baby white rhino, as you can see by his square lip. White rhino are grazers, which means they mainly eat grass and live on the prairies in Africa. You can clearly see the coarse hair that is starting to compress to form his hard horn, which will take many years to grow to the size of the adults. Even when very small, they seem to be able to run very fast. Both black and white rhino are found in very small numbers on the African continent due to the fact that poaching has had a terrible impact on their survival. Unlike the elephant, they are not very social creatures and are only likely to be found in small groups or alone. If threatened, they will either charge or face the threat with their horns facing outward.
Due to their poor eyesight, they are forever on the alert, using their powerful hearing and sense of smell. Young rhinos will stay with their mothers for two to four years. A cow will bear a calf every two to three years, which is another reason for their being so few in number. A rhino calf can follow its mother only three hours after its birth, and she will protect it aggressively against actual or possible danger. A calf will start grazing after about three months, but will continue to drink milk for at least another nine months. You can see that like the elephants, the rhinos also cover themselves with a coating of mud to protect themselves from parasites and to keep cool. Our young friend, meanwhile, feeling more confident, has wandered off to explore on his own, but also decides it is safer with his mother and goes off in search of her. Dominant bulls are very territorial and will mark their territory by spraying the surrounding bushes with urine. This is a warning to other bulls to keep their distance, although fighting among rhino seldom occurs. Atlantic Ocean. Many people think of it as merely a rich fishing ground or yet another dumping ground for the waste of eastern North America. Most people, however, do not see beyond this ocean's shores and boating surface. Underneath the waves of the Atlantic lies a vast world, largely unseen and unknown. Perhaps the key to preserving the health of our environment is to understand the relevance of the health of the oceans. The seas form the base of the food chain and are the place where life began on our fragile planet. These vast bodies of water are extremely important for the well-being of the Earth. Join us now on a short journey as we descend into the depths of this liquid realm beneath the sea to discover the majestic creatures making the North Atlantic their home. Atlantic is what is known as a temperate sea. That is, it is not tropical like the Caribbean, nor is it polar like the Arctic Ocean. Because it lies somewhere between these two extremes in temperature, the North Atlantic has a strange mixture of different types of creatures. The North Atlantic has a green tint, which it gets from large quantities of microscopic photosynthetic phytoplankton. The word plankton comes from the Greek to drift. Therefore, a plankton is anything which drifts and, contrary to popular belief, is not necessarily microscopic. Plant plankton, or phytoplankton, thrive in the cool, nutrient-rich waters of the North Atlantic. This phytoplankton forms the base of a huge food web, serving as food mostly for the animal plankton, called zooplankton. Zooplankton, in turn, is food for other ocean carnivores, 
from small fish to whales. It should not seem a surprise to learn that the North Atlantic has an incredible abundance of beautiful marine life. After all, since plankton production is the key to a plentiful marine food supply, it makes sense that the North Atlantic should have so much marine life. So why is the North Atlantic so frequently thought to have nothing of interest in it? The most likely explanation is the poor underwater visibility. Although the marine life may be present in large quantities, it can still be hard to find, simply because one has to be so close to something to see it. This is the unfortunate side effect of large quantities of phytoplankton. Our journey beneath the North Atlantic begins on the New England shore. We suit up and prepare for the dive on a beautiful sunny spring day. Tide's coming in. We enter the 50 degree water with enthusiasm and a desire to find many interesting creatures. And so begins our search for marine life. Almost at once, we have found something. It is a crab. There are many different types of crabs on the New England coast, and we often see several different species on every dive. This fellow is an Atlantic rock crab, which is common from the Arctic all the way to South Carolina. Rock crabs are found anywhere from shallow water to depths greater than 2,000 feet. Specimens have been found as large as five and one half inches wide. They are territorial and can fiercely defend themselves when disturbed. These two rock crabs are mating. The female will produce thousands of eggs which she will guard until they hatch. Few of the hatchlings will survive to adulthood, however. The unborn eggs are stored under the tail of the female, where she can keep them from harm. Lying on the sandy bottom, we find a sand collar. Although at first it may look like an old piece of broken pottery, close inspection will reveal that the collar is in fact flexible. A sand collar is actually the egg cluster of a large mollusk, the moon snail. Moon snails can grow to over five inches and frequently burrow into the sand and hide during the day. This one was filmed at night when they come out to feed. Suddenly, we spot a flounder. Flounder are a special type of fish which have evolved in such a way that they can lie on the ocean floor and blend into their environment. Besides being perfectly flat, flounder also have both eyes on the same side of their head. This preposterous twist of evolution allows the flounder to lie on the bottom and keep a good watch for predators. There are several different species of flounder in the North Atlantic. The winter flounder seen in this shot is known as a right-handed flounder because its eyes are located on the right side of its body. This fish can reach two feet in length. There are left-handed flounder as well. Also at home on the bottom is the skate. These gentle creatures look menacing, but are actually quite tame. They are relatives of the shark, having no bones in their bodies, but rather a cartilaginous skeleton.
A skate's mouth is located on its ventral surface or underside. This is one of the reasons why the skate is such an effective bottom feeder. Although they can occasionally be seen during the daytime, skates are easier to find at night when they are out prowling the nocturnal ocean floor looking for crustaceans, clams, worms, and sometimes squid. Skates have a stinger at the base of their tail, which can inflict a painful injury. Rarely, however, do skates hurt humans. Skates like these are found from the Gulf of St. Lawrence to North Carolina. They grow as large as almost three feet, including the tail length, and are found in water as deep as 350 feet. They are frequently found in water shallower than 100 feet. As we continue on our dive, we reach a rock outcropping jutting out of the sandy bottom like a mountain range in the desert. Clinging to the outcropping and swaying in the surge are many frilled sea anemones. Anemones look like big flowering plants, but they are not plants at all. They are animals, a member of a special phylum of invertebrate known as nidarians. This phylum also includes the jellyfish and corals. Sea anemones have hundreds or thousands of tentacles which have stinging cells in the tips. These immobilize the prey before it is pulled into the mouth. The mouth is in the center of the anemone and is sometimes hidden from view by the tentacles. Anemones eat any small creatures which they can catch, including plankton, shrimp, worms, small crustaceans, fish, and even an occasional sea urchin. Thinking it has caught a meal, this frilled anemone retracts in response to a diver's touch. The beautiful northern red anemone is quite common in the Gulf of Maine, but lives no further south than Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Northern red anemones have 100 tentacles and rings around the mouth and a more potent sting than that of the frilled anemone, enabling this anemone to capture even small fish. Here, a diver demonstrates just how effective the northern red anemone's tentacles can be. Few small fish can escape from the grip of this anemone's sticky tentacles. In spite of their name, northern red anemones are not necessarily red. They can be pink, orange, lavender, white, yellow, or combinations of those colors. Also found clinging to the rocks near the cliff are sea stars. These invertebrates are members of the entirely marine echinoderm phylum, which also includes sea urchins and sea cucumbers. This phylum of creatures is characterized by radial symmetry, which is readily apparent in the sea star. Most of the creatures in this phylum have five or a multiple of five appendages, but there are a few exceptions. Echinoderms have a unique system of propulsion known as a water vascular system, seen here in the northern sea star. The creature has a large number of feet, called tube feet, which are filled with seawater. The water vascular system within the body of the animal is also filled with seawater. By compressing certain chambers within the vascular system, the animal forces water into certain tube feet to extend them. Likewise, the animal can retract them. This can be used to walk by extending and retracting the right tube feet at the right time. The sea stars in the North Atlantic are extremely colorful, 
and can be found in many colors. All of these sea stars were photographed on one dive. The green sea urchin is an echinoderm with hundreds of pointy spines to protect itself from larger predators, and it is largely a scavenger, living off of what it can find on the bottom. The urchin is protected from many predators by its hundreds of pointy spines sticking out in all directions. Like other echinoderms, it uses tube feet for mobility. In fact, if you watch closely, you can see that this urchin is slowly moving away from the camera. We have worked our way out into deeper water. At a depth of 80 feet, we have found another echinoderm called a scarlet solus. This animal is a sea cucumber which has 10 long, highly branched tentacles and 5 teeth for capturing and consuming small prey. The feeding behavior of the scarlet solus is fascinating to watch. It holds all of its tentacles out in the water to allow passing plankton to get caught in the fine tentacle tips. It then licks off each tentacle one at a time by placing it in its mouth and pulling it back out again. This behavior can go on for hours. When disturbed, the scarlet solus protects itself by retracting into an unbelievably tiny bundle. This cold water creature is never found south of Massachusetts. When people think of ocean creatures, they usually think of fish. Many people picture in their minds the colorful reef fish found in the tropical waters, like the parrotfish, the angelfish, and the balloonfish. Other people think of the larger tropical fish, like the barracuda. The North Atlantic Ocean is not filled with tropical reef fish, but the North Atlantic has plenty of interesting and unique fish life. Hidden here amongst the seaweed is a sea raven. This fish is a bottom dweller, which is well suited for blending in with its environment, thanks to its highly evolved camouflage. The spines on the raven's back can be used defensively against any creature which disturbs the sea raven. Although you might think that a fish with this type of defense system would be very aggressive, it is not. These fish are so docile that they can be handled safely by humans as long as we are gentle. As a secondary and more passive defense, the sea raven can inflate its belly with water in order to appear larger than it really is. This may discourage some predators. The sea raven is a relative of the sculpin, a similar looking fish which also has sharp spines. Both the sculpin and the sea raven are relatives of the scorpion fish, a tropical fish with very poisonous spines. Also common in the North Atlantic is the lump fish. This curious looking fish has the uncommon habit among fish of guarding its eggs. The female lays eggs in the spring in nests under rock overhangs and in other protected areas. The male then stands guard until the eggs hatch. He also fans the eggs with his fins to keep marine growth and silt from settling on the eggs. Because the lumpfish does not eat at all while he is guarding the eggs, he will frequently go for over a month without food. Even when closely approached by divers, the lumpfish refuses to leave his post. In some European countries, the lumpfish eggs are a less expensive substitute for caviar, which is normally obtained from salmon. Lumpfish eggs are becoming more and more common as such a substitute because of the decline in the salmon population due to overfishing. On a dive in northern Maine, 
we are lucky enough to find the home of one of the fiercest fish in the North Atlantic, the wolf fish. This gruesome looking creature has very powerful jaws and sharp teeth. New England fishermen avoid this fish due to its reputation for being dangerous when caught. Wolf fish can easily bite off fingers and have also been rumored to bite through steel fishing leader. One of the wolf fish's favorite foods is sea urchin. How does the wolf fish eat this sharp and pointy echinoderm? Watch carefully. The bony plate inside the wolf fish's mouth allows them to crush the sharp spines and calcareous skeleton of the urchin with little effort. In spite of their remarkable jaws, these fish are quite shy and refuse to come out of their holes for us even when tempted with urchins. Wolf fish are frequently found in pairs. Remarkably, this is because once the wolf fish has found a mate, the pair remains together for life. Also common in the North Atlantic is the ocean pout. A pout is an eel-like fish having the head of a fish, but a body and tail resembling that of an eel. Pout are shy and usually hide in holes or cracks when we approach, but a bit of coaxing will get them out for a full view. Once out of their holes, however, pouts quickly grow tired of posing for cinematographers and make a break for deeper water. Also found in deep water but away from the bottom is the dogfish. Dogfish have a misleading name, for they are actually small sharks. Coming in contact with a school of these creatures is uncommon for they are skittish and seem to avoid human contact. Our experience was unexpected and brief, with a small school of the creatures emerging from the green haze and circling us curiously for a few minutes. Like most sharks, their reputation for being dangerous to man is exaggerated. To search for other types of creatures, it is necessary to dive at night. Many creatures are nocturnal and are easy to find at night, while they may be difficult or impossible to find during the day. Entering the surf after sunset, we are searching for these nocturnal ocean creatures with the help of some powerful flashlights. Get ready. Ready? Go. Oh, let's do it. Almost as soon as we enter the water, we have found a small school of Atlantic longfin squid hovering in the still water. Among the talents of squid is the ability to change color almost instantaneously. Watch the color pattern on one of the squid in this shot, and you will see this phenomenon in action. Squid change color in response to their mood. Their normal color is white, while squid being chased by cinematographers usually turn red rather quickly. This intelligent species is found near the ocean surface to a depth of 300 feet from the Bay of Fundy to the West Indies. They prefer darker water 
and therefore rarely venture into shallow water except at night during the spawning season. In spawning season, squid lay their eggs on plants and rocks in large bundles. Squid are mollusks, but bear little resemblance to their snail cousins. The squid has a shell, but it is located inside of its body. Squid can swim or hover using the fins on the front part of their bodies. When squid need to go somewhere in a hurry, they can take off by squirting a jet of water out of their mantle cavity through a nozzle called a siphon. This is a very effective way for a streamlined creature like the squid to move quickly. At night, the seafloor is covered with northern lobsters. Regarded as a delicacy in the United States, this frightening-looking arthropod makes its way across the ocean terrain looking for a meal. Meals consist of just about anything that the lobster can find. It is a scavenger. Northern lobsters grow up to 34 inches long and stand 9 inches high. They are found from northern Canada to Virginia. The lobster's two dissimilar claws serve different purposes. The larger claw, referred to as the crusher, is designed to crack hard objects like snails and clams. The smaller claw, known as the cutter, is used for tearing apart the prey or plant material on which the animal feeds. Frequently, lobsters fight over territory or food and end up losing one or both claws in the process. Amazingly, these claws can be regenerated over time. We also find a peculiar bottom-dwelling fish known as a sea robin. This colorful carnivore has large, wing-like pectoral fins, which are used to glide effortlessly at less than one inch above the ocean floor. This gliding technique lends itself well to the pursuit of the sea robin's favorite foods, shrimp, mussels, and small crabs. Even more unusual than the sea robin's gigantic pectoral fins are its finger-like extensions of the pectoral fins, which are used to crawl along the bottom and feel for food. The North Atlantic Ocean is a vast and fascinating world. We cannot even begin to describe all of the creatures which live in the North Atlantic in just one film. There are untold numbers of animals living in the ocean that we haven't even discovered yet. But understanding just a few of the species living in the ocean is a step towards a much greater awareness of the oceans themselves and the world around us.
jungle of tropical Africa. And in the shadow of Africa's tall volcanoes live some of the rarest animals on Earth. This is a mountain gorilla. Only a few hundred of them are alive today. They live in the dense mountain rainforests near the border between Zaire and Rwanda. Pygmy chimpanzees, which are properly known as bonobos, live in the rainforest around the river Zaire. Scientists have not been able to study bonobos as much as they've studied other apes. Bonobos live secretive lives deep in the jungle, far away from humans. The river Zaire is surrounded by thick tropical rainforests where many different plants and animals live. The forests are so thick that scientists may not yet have discovered all the plant and animal species there. Today, scientists are racing to identify new life forms in rainforests all over the world. They want to protect the plants and animals from becoming extinct. Scientists discovered bonobos here in 1926 and called them pygmy chimpanzees. Even though they are very similar, bonobos are actually a whole different species, not just a smaller version of the chimpanzee. From their hidden observation post, researchers hope to learn more about bonobos. The more people learn about an animal species, the better we can protect it. Since bonobos are so hard to find in the deep jungle, the researchers have put out some sugar cane to lure them into a clearing. They hope to learn more about the bonobo's behavior in a social group. One bonobo has found the sugar cane. The stalks are hard and brittle on the outside, but most apes love to eat the sweet pulp inside. We know that bonobos live in groups just like chimpanzees. If this one has discovered the sugarcane feast, the rest of his group cannot be far behind. Here comes another bonobo already. Chimpanzees, gorillas, and bonobos are all apes, a family of animals that belongs to a larger animal order called primates. Monkeys and lemurs are also primates, but they are not apes. Apes are the largest and most intelligent animals in the primate order. Like chimpanzees, bonobos have long arms and short legs. Black hair covers most of their bodies, except for their faces, ears, fingers, and toes, which are bare. A full-grown male chimpanzee is about four feet tall, that's 122 centimeters. It weighs up to 106 pounds, or about 48 kilograms. A full-grown male bonobo is just a little smaller, about three feet nine inches tall, 114 centimeters. It weighs up to 100 pounds, or about 45 kilograms. Bonobos and chimpanzees are active during daylight hours. They do most of their sleeping at night, but sometimes try to get a nap in during the day. Both chimps and bonobos are great tree climbers. They use trees as safe sleeping places and escape there from danger. But they actually spend most of their days on the ground, traveling from place to place in search of food. Scientists used to think that all apes were vegetarians, eating only fruits and vegetables. But now they know that chimpanzees and bonobos are really omnivores. Like humans, they eat all kinds of food, fruit, leaves, seeds, and bark. They also eat insects and even hunt small animals for an occasional meal of meat. Chimpanzees and bonobos have hands that can grip firmly. With fingers, they can use almost as skillfully as we can use ours. 
These abilities help them to gather a great variety of foods. Their hands also allow them to use things like twigs or sticks as tools. Only the most intelligent of animals learn how to use tools to make their lives easier. Chimps and bonobos are very social animals. They live with others of their kind rather than living alone and interact with each other often throughout the day. They live in communities with as many as 50 individuals. Within that larger community, there are smaller groups of three to six animals who usually do things together. The individuals within a smaller group are often close family members, but that's not always true. Sometimes, they're just friends. While they might compete with individuals from the larger community, Close group members play together, share food, groom each other, and comfort each other. They'll travel from place to place together too, as the whole community follows the food supply through the jungle. The small groups stay together for a while, but not forever. When new friends are found, new groups are formed. Chimp and bonobo social scenes are constantly changing. Close friends and relatives also serve as allies when fights and disagreements occur. Chimpanzees and bonobos normally don't hurt each other when they fight. One usually just frightens another into backing down. They might disagree about who gets to sit in a special place sleep in a certain tree, or play with another friend. The winner of the disagreement gets more respect from others in the community. Chimps and bonobos communicate their feelings through body positions, gestures, and the sounds they make with their voices. They don't sound much like words to us, but every sound they make has a meaning to other chimps and bonobos. Female chimpanzees and bonobos have their first babies when they are 12 or 13 years old. After being pregnant for about eight months, a single baby is born. In rare cases, a female will have twins. The young stay close to their mothers for about five years. At that point, the mothers wean them. They no longer feed them or carry them around. Some mothers will continue to help their sons and daughters throughout life backing them up during power struggles with others in the community. Young chimps and bonobos learn from watching others. They learn how to find food, communicate, parent, and swing through the trees by watching others do it. They can live to be 40 years old. In the same region of Africa, but in a completely different kind of environment, live the largest apes in the world. On the border of the African nations of Zaire and Rwanda, there is a national park. The park is filled with volcanoes and mountains covered by thick jungle. This is the home of the mountain gorilla. There are lowland gorillas in other parts of Africa, but this is the only place the mountain gorilla can be found. While lowland gorillas still number in the thousands, there are only a few hundred mountain gorillas left in the world. They roam this dense jungle which they share with leopards, hyenas, elephants, and many other animals. These large, powerful apes look ferocious, but they are much gentler than they look. Gorillas are vegetarians, meaning that all the food they eat comes from plants. They especially like wild celery, bamboo shoots, thistle leaves, and fruit. They also eat roots and the pulp and bark of trees. An adult male gorilla can be six feet tall. That's 183 centimeters. He can weigh 400 pounds or 181 kilograms. Adult females weigh only about half as much.
Although they sometimes climb trees, adult gorillas spend almost all of their time on the ground. They can walk upright for a short distance, but usually travel on all fours with their weight on their feet and on the knuckles of their hands. Since gorillas are such large animals, and since their diet of plants is not very rich in protein, they must eat huge amounts of food every day. In fact, they spend most of their lives either looking for food or eating it. That's why gorillas live only in thick, lush jungles. Food is everywhere. All they have to do is pick it up. The mountain gorilla's rainforest home receives over 70 inches of rain every year. Since gorillas don't make dens or shelters, they spend a lot of time out in the rain. But nature has prepared them for it. The fuzzy hair all over their bodies is water resistant, so it helps keep most of their skin dry. The warm sun helps them dry off as soon as the rain stops. Gorillas live in groups that can number from a few to over 20 animals. They travel around together, eat together, and sleep in the same place. Each group is led and protected by an older male gorilla. He's called a silverback because he has a band of silver hair across his back. Like chimpanzees and bonobos, gorillas communicate with their body language and with the sounds they can make with their voices. Since he's the leader and protector of his group, the silverback must become skilled at communicating with gorillas of all ages. Researchers have identified many sounds and signals gorillas use in communicating. Those sounds include warning screams, scolding grunts, threatening roars, and even playful chuckles. A silverback will usually start building his family group when he's about 12 years old. Since gorillas can live to be 35 or 40 years old, he could be responsible for leading and protecting his family for 20 to 30 years. Mountain gorillas form strong attachments to their group. They will stay together for many years, even though a few members might come and go. Sons of the silverback will leave the group when they reach late adolescence. Most will attract females and form their own groups as they get older. Daughters of the silverback will find another group to join when they become adults at about eight years of age. This six-year-old female is like most gorillas her age. Between the ages of three and six, gorillas act like human children. They climb trees, chase each other, play tug of war, and just lay around looking at the jungle and the sky. This three-year-old male has been able to find food for himself for over a year. He likes to spend time with friends his own age and learns things from the older gorillas in the group. He stayed close to his mother until this year, when she had a new baby. After being pregnant, they only four pounds or two kilograms when they're born. Mother gorillas care for their babies constantly, never leave them alone. At first, a baby gorilla will cling to its mother's chest as she moves about. But soon, it will be strong enough to ride around on her back. Later, it will learn to move about on its own and will get into all kinds of mischief. For gorillas, grooming is a social activity as well as a practical one. Gorillas who want to make friends and become more popular within the group will work hard at grooming others just to please them. Gorillas often form close friendships within a group. The friends eat, sleep, and play together more than they do with the other gorillas. 
Adolescents will sometimes form a new group with their close friends when they become adults and are forced to leave the Silverbacks group. These young gorillas love to wrestle for fun, but when they grow up, their fighting will sometimes be serious. Most adult gorillas solve their disagreements by bluffing each other. That means they put on a show to look mean, but they will avoid a fight if they can. An angry gorilla might beat his chest, throw sticks and leaves, pound on the ground, or fiercely charge at his enemy. The one that holds firm when the other retreats in fear is the winner. But sometimes a real fight breaks out. If the fight is between rival silverbacks, they might injure each other badly. Female gorillas fight sometimes too, but those fights are usually not serious. Mountain gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos have been disappearing from the wild. When people cut down rainforests and replace them with cropland, there is nowhere left for the apes to go. But people have also learned much more about the great apes and how they live. Many efforts have been made to protect them. More parks and preserves have been set aside in which the world's great apes can live. Their populations have already increased in some areas. Knowledge and understanding will help us save these wonderful, intelligent animals. that gets cold in the winter. You know how chilly the days can be. We can stay indoors on cold days. But what about the animals in cold northern climates? Especially those in or near an icy sea. This solid looking landscape is actually part of the North Pacific Ocean, just north of Japan. A huge layer of floating ice blocks, called an ice flow, chokes the sea here every winter. These time-lapse pictures show how the ice flow creeps into this harbor, completely clogging it with ice in just a few weeks. The air temperature is about zero degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus 18 degrees Celsius all winter long. What kind of animals can survive in this frozen world? A large flock of stellar sea eagles roost for the night in a forest near the ocean. Stellar sea eagles are very large birds, similar to the American bald eagle. Many of them actually migrate here to spend the winter in this frigid place. Why do they fly here instead of going somewhere warmer? Like most birds, stellar sea eagles follow their food supply around the world. It's hard to believe, but there's plenty of food for them here. They roost in the forest at night, but spend their days at the seaside on the floating ice. This frozen environment offers the eagles so much food every winter that more of them gather here than anywhere else in the world. At sunrise, the fishing boats set out for the ice-filled ocean. The eagles leave at sunrise too, they're after the same prize as the fishing fleet. Large schools of fish gather under the floating ice. So fishing season is at its height when the ice flow arrives. These special vessels are the only ships capable of moving through the ice-filled sea. Their nets catch lots of fish but many get loose and fall back into the water. No fish goes to waste here with so many hungry eagles and other birds around. The nets are pulled up twice each day, creating a banquet of free food for the eagles. The fish float in the water, so the eagles don't have to hunt or work for their meals. 
they just grab the fish and feed. Like most predators, eagles eat the most nutritious parts first, the eggs and internal organs. At one time, only a few dozen stellar sea eagles spent the winter in this region. But commercial fishing has increased their food supply. Now, about half of all the stellar sea eagles in the world migrate here every year. Some white-tailed sea eagles spend the winter here too. Unlike the stellars, sea eagles, which spend the summer breeding season farther north, many white-tailed sea eagles live here all year long. Both the white-tailed and stellar sea eagles prefer to eat fish. But when fish aren't available, they will catch and eat small animals, like foxes, rabbits, and even young seals. Sea eagles have wingspans up to eight feet or two and a half meters in width. They can carry prey weighing up to 20 pounds, or about nine kilograms. They will usually attack crows and seagulls too, but with plenty of fish around, this crow can safely snatch some leftovers. This seagull has a meal all to itself. Most gulls are scavengers, always on the lookout for easy food. They search garbage dumps and fish docks for scraps. Some of them migrate long distances between their winter and summer homes. This gull is north of Japan for the winter, but might spend next summer in Alaska. Eagles and gulls aren't the only winter visitors here. Marine mammals like seals and sea lions arrive each year just before the ice flow. Sea lions are part of the fur seal family. They're very large animals. Adult males can be eight feet or two and a half meters long and weigh up to 2,000 pounds or 900 kilograms. The females are smaller, but their bodies are still packed with a thick layer of fat, which they need to keep warm in the freezing water. Sea lions spend most of their time in the water, swimming, playing, and catching their favorite foods, fish and other underwater animals like octopus, squid, and shrimp. Some people confuse sea lions with seals, but there are important differences between them. Sea lions and other fur seals are not true seals. Sea lions can use their feet and flippers in more ways on land than seals can. They can sit up straight with their heads high up off the ground. Sea lions and fur seals have ears that we can see. True seals have smooth heads. Their ears are just small holes hidden under their glossy fur. Their flippers are not as useful on land as the sea lions. Although they move smoothly in the water, on land, their movements usually look like a worm inching its way along. While most sea lions have their babies, which are called pups in the summer months, many seals give birth on winter ice flows around the world. They actually raise their pups on the floating blocks of ice. This ribbon seal is here for the protection and food supply that come with the yearly ice flow. Since they're much more graceful in water than on land, seals spend even more time in the ocean than sea lions do. Like sea lions, seals love to eat fish, squid and shellfish, but some seals also eat birds, like gulls and penguins. Let's see what other kinds of life can survive in these ice-cold waters. Enough sunlight comes through the ice above to nourish a thick green carpet of marine algae, also known as seaweed. It provides food and hiding places for many creatures. Jellyfish are more common in warmer oceans. This one has stinging tentacles over five feet or one and a half meters long. It uses them to paralyze fish and other prey. Most species of crabs live underwater. They are in the crustacean family, 
and are closely related to shrimps and lobsters. Most are omnivorous, which is another way of saying they'll eat almost anything. They often act as scavengers, helping to keep the seafloor clean. Here's a seabed covered with scallops. Like clams and oysters, scallops are bivalve mollusks, shellfish with two shells that are hinged together. There are more than 300 species of scallops around the world. These are living on a sea floor about 30 feet or nine meters deep, but some live at depths of almost 300 feet, about 90 meters. Their shells are protective coverings for the soft muscles and organs inside. They eat by filtering water through their bodies and capturing microscopic plants and animals in the water. Scallops are food for other animals. This starfish attacks by trying to suffocate the scallop. The starfish closes the scallop's valves so that it can't get oxygen from the water. But scallops can escape. They are the only bivalves able to squirt water from their shells and propel themselves away from a predator. This amazing little creature is called a clione, a species of sea butterfly. They're not really butterflies, but sea snails with wing-like foot extensions they use for swimming. Sea butterflies live in oceans all over the world and are an important part of the food chain. They're food for many of the fish that people catch, like herring. When the long cold winter is almost over, the floating ice begins to melt. Some animals on the ice flow will be leaving soon. Others will arrive. By April, the ice has melted enough for a school of beaked whales to enter the harbor. Last fall, these whales went south to avoid the winter ice, but now they're back in search of food. As the ice melts, the sea becomes rich in plankton, microscopic plants and animals which attract large schools of fish. The fish attract squid, which eat the fish, and squid is the beaked whale's favorite food. Beaked whales will dive as deeply as they have to to capture a meal of squid, which sometimes live far below the surface. Because of their hunting habits, some beaked whales stay underwater 30 minutes or more. But like all whales, beaked whales are mammals and must come to the surface to breathe air. They can't live here in the winter when the ice flow is almost frozen solid. The melting ice flow means changes for all the winter visitors here. Many animals will migrate north to their breeding grounds and bear young. Most of the seals will head for the open ocean and they'll be taking their new pups with them. This ribbon seal pup is about 24 inches or 94 centimeters long and is covered with beautiful downy white fur. The baby coat is extra thick to protect the pup from cold until it can store more body fat. The white fur also camouflages the pup, blending it into the icy background so predators will have a hard time seeing it. Mother seals often leave their pups on the ice while they go diving for fish to eat. When the pup gets hungry, it cries for its mother. This pup's umbilical cord is still attached, which means it's only a few days old. It's hard to believe that such a helpless, cuddly baby can survive in this icy world, but it was born with everything it needs to get by. The pup can already pull itself across the ice. Soon it will be swimming gracefully through the cold ocean water, using its webbed front and back feet as easily as fish use their fins. Even in the frigid water, its thick waterproof fur will keep the pup warm and dry. The pup's mother finally appears. 
There are many other ribbon seal pups on the ice floe. But she knows this is her pup by checking its scent. Pregnant female ribbon seals spend the winter on and under the ice floe. They dive for fish and wait for their pups to be born. Ribbon seal pups are born right on the ice, usually in early April. Ribbon seals are named for the bands or ribbons of light and dark fur on the coats of the adults. The pups will shed their baby fur and begin to develop darker adult coats when they're three or four weeks old. This pup's mother is hunting for food in the icy water. The youngster's cries finally convince the mother seal to join her pup on the ice floe. While the adult seal can hunt for fish to eat, the pup will rely completely on its mother's milk during the first month of life. Seal's milk is half fat. It has 10 times more fat than cow's milk. So seal pups grow very fast and quickly get a thick layer of blubber under their skins. Ribbon seal pups have only one month to drink the rich milk before they're weaned. Their mothers then teach them to catch their own meals in the ocean. The pups only have a short time to get ready for the icy underwater world where they'll spend most of their lives. Soon, these ice blocks will melt. The pup and its mother will set out for the open waters of the North Pacific. They might swim as far as the Bering Sea, or even through the Bering Strait and into the Arctic Ocean. Ribbon seals and other seal species that spend most of their lives in the open ocean often migrate great distances each year. They follow ice flows and the food sources under them. The mother supports her pup as it learns to swim near the water's surface. young, the pup must come up to breathe much more often than its mother. But soon the pup will swim faster than 10 miles or 16 kilometers per hour, using the front flippers to steer and the back flippers for speed, much like fish use their tail fins. In a few months, the pup will catch fish and other prey as skillfully as its mother. They swim off into the Arctic summer, but like the sea eagles and sea lions, they'll soon be back when the ice flow comes south once again.